Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable to the Vice Minister Religion of Affairs, Honorable to the Rector of Universitas Islam Negeri Akademi Banda Aceh, Honorable to the Dean and Vice Dean Faculty of Science and Technology, Honorable to the Head of Administration Faculty of Science and Technology, Minister. Honorable to all keynote speakers. Honorable to the Chairman of Aceh International Conference on Science and Technology. Honorable to all heads of departments, faculty of science and technology, lecturers, students, presenters, and all participants of international conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a wonderful and precious journey for me to be your master of ceremony in this virtual session on Tuesday, 26th of October 2021 in our big event, first, Aceh International Conference on Science and Technology with a team improving for scheduling environment for science and technology. I would like to thank that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been giving us blessing and nurses so we can play this morning program in good condition. My salam and salam are what's given to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa sallam. Who has taught their people respectively in order to attend happy and prosperous life in his work and year after. So the first agenda is reciting the Holy Quran and continue by salawat. They will be recited by our brother Ali Ramadan, the student at Faculty of Science and Technology. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh
Amin. The next, the next agenda is the Indonesian National Anthem in Indonesia Raya.
greeting speech by chairman we would like to invite dr, dr. abdul mujahid, abdul mujahid hamdan to deliver the speech
next breathing speech will be delivered by the first vice rector of Universitas Islam Negeri Araniri, Banda Aceh. Yeah. 
Kalimantan has already been mentioned by me before, and also Dr. Adri Huda, who is a postdoctoral student department of Mechanical Engineering, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. This is the first international conference which has been abbreviated as ICOS or ACEH International Conference on Science and Technology. This is international conference that will be um, will be held today. And this conference aims to provide a communication and collaboration forum for government, scientists, and stakeholders focusing on adaptive design, water resources engineering, environmental management, pollution control, climate change, biomedicine, microbiology, ICT, ICT and Islam, human computer interaction, pervasive computing or mobile computing, and then also dealing with artificial intelligence, implementation of e-learning and multimedia in pandemic era, applied biology, halal industry, halal science, health and conventional modeling, ethnobotany, pandemic and business, entrepreneurship and communication, and so on and so forth. We hope that this seminar will contribute many positive change, many positive um, additional values, especially to strengthen our academics, um, our, to our, academic, our academic contribution to improve the technology, especially applied technology, to be more benefit, to be more beneficial to human life. And hopefully, any new finding of this conference will be well published through our collective our cooperation in journal, not only in local, national journals, but also international journal with a well-known Scopus Index journal. And last but not least, I would like to stress that together we can contribute more and together we can do better. Finally, I would like to invite our Vice Minister for Religious Affairs, Bapa Haji Zainu Tauhid Saadi, to deliver his keynote speech in this seminar, as well as to open this international conference officially. Thank you very much for all attendance of this seminar, both Hadir in, I mean, who is attending uh, directly in this uh, forum or room, and who are Hadir out, who is um, attending um, this seminar through Zoom. Allahumma wafi ala kamitariq, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Opening speech that will be delivered by the Vice Ministry Religion of Affairs. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, alladhi binamatihi tatimu salihat. Wa bi fadlihi tatanazzalul khairat wal barakat Wa bi tawfiqihi tatahakakul maqasid wal ghayat Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Sayyidina Muhammad Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum ihsani illa yawmil ma'ad Amma ba'du Yang saya hormati Rektor Uwin Araniri Banda Aceh atau yang wakili dalam hal ini diwakili oleh Bapak Wakil Rektor Bapak Dr. Gunawan yang sermati Dekan Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi UIN Araniri 
Yang sermati Ketua Konferens Bapak Dr. Abdul Mujahid Hamdan Para mahasiswa peserta Aikos Tamu undangan Hadirin hadirat yang berbahagia Sebelumnya saya mohon maaf Saya menyampaikan sambutan ini Dengan bahasa Indonesia Pertama-tama marilah kita senantiasa memanjatkan puji syukur kehadirat Allah Subhanahu Taala, Tuhan yang Maha Kuasa yang telah memberikan berbagai nikmat, rahmat dan karunia yang luar biasa sehingga kita dapat hadir dalam pembukaan International Conference on Science and Technology. Selawat dan salam tidak lupa kita sanjungkan kepada Nabi Besar Muhammad Wasallam kepada keluarga dan para sahabatnya Dan semoga kita semuanya akan mendapatkan syafaatnya di Ombil Qiyamah Amin, Allah Amin Atas nama Kementerian Agama Republik Indonesia Saya berbangga hati dan memberikan apresiasi atas digelarnya Kompetisi yang bergengsi di kalangan mahasiswa sains dan teknologi di UIN Araniri, Banda Aceh. Bapak Rektor, Wakil Rektor, peserta yang berbahagia. Bagi saya, UIN Araniri, Banda Aceh adalah satu di antara PTKIN yang mengalami perkembangan yang sangat pesat, baik dari sisi penguatan Kelembagaan, sumber daya manusia, kurikulum, dan pembelajaran, serta kultur dan tradisi akademik, serta dinamika dan prestasi para mahasiswanya. Salah satu ciri dan menjadi keunggulan UIN adalah adanya mandat integrasi Islam dan sains, yang berarti adanya pendekatan ajaran agama Islam, ayat-ayat Maudiyah dan umum dengan ayat-ayat Maudiyah secara integratif dan interkonektif. Artinya kedua ilmu tersebut saling melengkapi, bukan saling menegasikan ataupun mendikotomikan. Model integrasi keilmuan ini tercermin dalam profil para mahasiswa dan para alumninya yang terampil menjelaskan ilmu-ilmu keislaman secara holistik, integratif, sesuai dengan tantangan zaman. Karenanya digelarnya kompetisi sains dan teknologi kali ini menjadi sangat strategis untuk kepentingan integrasi agama dan sains. Selaku Wakil Menteri Agama, saya meyakini bahwa salah satu komponen terpenting dalam memajukan peradaban adalah pendidikan. Untuk itu, agar peran pendidikan tinggi keagamaan Islam tidak terisolasi, maka ijtihad wider mandate dengan ekspansi ilmu-ilmu umum, natural science, jadi sebuah Kenisayaan. Di era pandemi COVID-19 kita rasakan dan disadarkan bahwa tidak ada satu ilmuwan yang tunggal dapat menyelesaikan persoalan. Semua ahli dan keilmuwan harus bergerak bersinergi dan bekerja sama kolaboratif. Bagi saya PTKIN dengan UI-nya sangat strategis karena temuan keilmuan apapun ternyata tanpa ada support dan pendekatan serta penjelasan keagamaan menjadi sangat tumpul di lapangan para mahasiswa peserta ikos yang berbahagia saya selalu berpesan bagi yang diberikan mandat institusi integrasi Islam dan sains seperti UIN Araniri Banda Aceh ini jangan sampai akhirnya memperlemah 
kompetensinya dalam bidang ilmu-ilmu keislaman poin harus tegas menjadi mutu dan kualitas untuk mewujudkan misi integratif dengan DNA para aluminya menebarkan Islam yang memberikan rahmat bagi seluruh alam Islam rahmat dalil alamin saya ingin sosok Sarah Gilbert ilmuwan penemu vaksin AstraZeneca dari Inggris yang dapat apresiasi banyak pihak karena tak ambil untung hak paten vaksin akan banyak dilahirkan dari alumni kampus PTKIN kita karena bagi saya itulah salah satu contoh konkret dakwah nyata dakwah bilhal dan merupakan realisasi Islam yang memberikan rahmat bagi seluruh alam semesta hadirin yang saya muliakan saya memberikan apresiasi dan penghargaan yang setinggi-tingginya kepada seluruh sivitas akademika UIN Araniri Banda Aceh yang dipelopori oleh Fakultas Sains dan Teknologi atas inisiasinya menggelar kompetisi yang bergensi di kalangan mahasiswa ini setiap kompetisi tentu ada menang dan ada yang kalah ada yang menjadi juara dan ada yang belum jadi juara saudara-saudara harus melandasi keikutsertaan lomba ini dengan semangat sportivitas yang tinggi di atas kejuaraan ada kemanusiaan dan persahabatan demikian sambutan ini yang dapat kami sampaikan semoga Allah Subhanahu ta'ala senantiasa memberikan kemudahan serta keberkahan bagi kita dalam mengantarkan sang juara manusia-manusia yang terpilih menjadi yang terbaik melalui kompetisi ini dengan mengucapkan bismillahirrahmanirrahim kegiatan International Conference on Science and Technology UIN Araneri Banda Aceh saya nyatakan dibuka In uridu ila yuslah wa ma taufiq ila billah wallahu ma fiq illa akum tarik wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh The prayers which will be led by Alif Ramadan Allahumma <tuh> <tuh> 
اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم عافنا في بدننا اللهم عافنا في سمعنا اللهم عافنا في بصرنا اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا ولوالدينا وارحمهما كما ربنا صغارا ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصلى الله على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Amin ya rabbal alamin That's the end of opening ceremony The next session will be guided by our moderator Ibu Fitriani Insanuri Kismullah We invite all participants to participate in a parallel session Which will be held at 2pm after the lunch break The topics that will be raised are one, increasing learning environment in pandemic era, two, earth and environmental management, three, nature and biodiversity, four, life science and natural product, five, design and science engineering. After entering the main room in Zoom, select the break room which interests you. For the detail of speaker, you can check the abstract book that has been distributed or the ICOS website. Distinguished guests, as our warmest greeting, dancer of Sanggar Seni Selawat will perform welcoming dance. With the dance performance later, it will be the end of the entire series of opening ceremony for today. Jazakumullahu khairan kafiran Billahi taufiq wal hidayah Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Let's welcome Megisa Dance Yeah. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Good morning and good evening to all speakers, presenters and participants Welcome, welcome to the very first international conference on science and technology uh, first of all, let us praise to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that for His blessings and mercy, we are able to gather in this event. Secondly, may peace be upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Through his guidance, we can see brightness from the darkness era. My name is Fitriyani Kismullah. As a part of this event, I will be moderating this session. I'm super excited to have all of you here, excited about all the amazing conversations that we are going to have today. This conference is organized by the Faculty of Science and Technology at the Islamic State University, well known as UIN Araniri Banda Aceh. The organization of this conference is a means of acknowledgement to exchange information and knowledge with the major theme, improving post-pandemic environment through science and technology. We value working with amazing facilitators like those who we have today. On behalf of the committee, I would like to extend a profound gratitude to our five keynote speakers. who also We also express our warm welcome to all distinguished presenters today. Thank you very much for fulfilling our invitation to be here with us. This is a tribute to the university. And for all the audiences today, thank you very much for joining our first session. We humbly invite everyone to participate in this conference. All students are encouraged to join. Please join. Hopefully by the end of our keynote speeches, we can gather new ideas from research findings to broaden our knowledge through this international dialogue. By the end of the session, we expect some questions for the speakers and we do hope that um, all invited guests can participate until the end. Now, uh, before we, we begin, just a quick note uh, that this session will be recorded, so please be aware of it. Uh, all right, now I will finally open the session. Here with us today, we have five amazing keynote speakers that are very known professionals, and we are very lucky to have them here with us today. We have three speakers from Malaysia, one speaker from Indonesia, and one speaker from the United States, mashallah. The session will start with a 20-minute presentation, each from the first and second keynote speakers, followed by the first question and answer session for both speakers at the end of two of their presentations. We will then proceed with three more keynote speakers from Malaysia, continued by the second answer question and answer session at the end of all presentations. Should we have time, by the end, we will have our panel discussions afterward. I would like to introduce today's uh, first keynote speaker. Joining us this morning is a present postdoctoral student in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts, United States. He pursued his doctoral education as a Doctor of Environmental Science at the University of Sriwijaya with the topic of his dissertation, Photocatalytic Oxidation of Textile Dyes as a Model of Organic Wastewater Using Visible Light Activated Tin Oxide Photocatalyst. Dr. Huda is majoring in material and biomaterial formulation, preparation and characterization such as photocatalysis, heterogeneous cat catalyst, and hybrid material. Currently working on the development of recycling process of lithium ion battery, solid state lithium ion battery, and perovskite solar cell M, he has published a significant number of work in reputable journals. So I would like to formally request a fresh, hardworking, and experienced laboratory researcher who has made us very proud with his international achievements to begin his presentation. To Dr. Adri Huda, the 20-minute time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, everyone. Honorables, the vice ministers, directors, the dean, the head of department, the head of the committees, the keynote speakers, the professors, invited speakers, and all of the participants. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for inviting me today here. It's very, um, it's very honorable for me, especially to, to talk here. Um, 
share my score points. Okay. Okay, sorry for the delay. So, my name is Adri Huda. I'm coming from the Department of Mechanical Engineer, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, United States. So, the first of all, I want to say congratulations to all the committee who who have managed this uh, very nice uh, first IT International Conference on Science and Technology. I wish that the conference will be held annually, and then we can share our knowledge. I mean, like we can share our progress annually. This is really nice because um, I could see all of the very talented and expert uh, keynote speaker. I think I'm the youngest one here. I don't have a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, experience, but I try to do my best today. So before I talk more about um, the topics that I want to share to you today, let me introduce my current affiliation. So my current affiliation is Worcester Polytechnic Institute, or we could say WPI, is the project-based learning university, and uh, we well known as the four uh, main project, uh, which is the university is basically is not only theoretically, and then we try to combine four aspects during our um, studying process or learning process, which is. Um, the theoretical approach, the practice, the global and impact. So four of it, we try to combine together and then we try to spread to our student. So our student can, you know, like having a very nice experience during her study in WPI and then the most uh, effectively uh, extract all of the knowledge. So we want our student to learn by doing in WPI so he can express him himself and then uh, become a very better man, uh, like very, uh, very good investment in human resources. So uh, talking about WPI itself, I want to show you about our alumni. So there is hundreds of alumni in WPI, but I tried to pick uh, three of them. Um, sorry, I think there is some someone tried. To. So uh, the first of all is Robert Gordert. This is our first alumni. I am very inspired by the Robert Gordert. The Robert Gordert is well known as the father of uh, modern recoveries. So his foundings um, give a really a good contribution to the modern rocket science right now. And then his foundings also contribute to the successful of uh, space explo exploration right now conducting by NASA, for example, because uh, he tried to develop the basic, uh, the basic pilot scale of rocket science at that time. So the second one is uh, Navin Selva Durai. And this man is, um, this is an alumni in 2002. He is the founder of Foursquare. If you have use this uh, software. This, um, the Foursquare is basically is a software where you can check in, you can make a reports or give a feedback when you visit, uh, for example, a place. And for example, you visit a restaurant or you visit a city and you want to make a report about it. So basically in here in United States, people use Foursquare to make a report. And then the second alumni is Dean Kamen. 
own here in United States. And then what he, he invent is uh, the, the kind of transportation. It's a Segway. It's a, here in United States, a lot of people using it, especially the security in the, some area, or maybe you can find it in the airport where the security try to, you know, like checking the airport using this, uh, uh, the Segway. So three of them is a very inspirational alumni. And then I could say they are very well known here in United States, especially in WPI especially the Robert Goddard, where if you visit Massachusetts, uh, you will say, uh, you will see uh, there is a welcoming to the Goddard city. So this is the, our alumni. So the next thing is I want to share you about the location of WPA itself. Uh, WPA located in Worcester, uh, in the center of Massachusetts. It's about 80 kilometers from the, the capital city of Massachusetts, which well known is of Boston. So it's only like 80 kilometers. Um, we, get, we could say like, like a two hours driving from Boston to Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts is, uh, itself, it's located in the east coast of the uh, United States, which is uh, next to some uh, the other state, for example, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, New York, and the Connecticut, also Rhode Island, I'm sorry. So in WPA itself, there are, sorry, So in WPA itself, there is five research focus area in our university. The first one is a health and biotech. The second one is robotic and internet of things. The third is advanced material and manufacturing. The fourth, the cyber data and security. And the last one in learning of science. My current affiliation is a part of advanced materials and manufacturing. So all of this research focus area is divided into three main uh, faculty, uh, which are the Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Art and Science, and the last one is Business School. And then our current affiliation is located in the Faculty of Engineering to be more specific in the Department of uh, Mechanical Engineer. So my current affiliation is uh, in Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Labs under the supervisors of uh, Professor Winston, Winston Sabwager. He is also the Provost of the University the professor of university, and then he also the lead of three uh, main laboratories in WPI. The first one is the Advanced Material and Manufacturing Labs, which is the energy uh, best lab. And then the second one, he also the lead of the biotechnology uh, and bioengineering laboratories. And then he also the lead of the lead of the multifunctional laboratories. This is the first introduction of my current affiliation. And then let's jump into the next uh, topics. Uh, before I start, I want to acknowledge some of our college. The first of all, I want to say uh, thank you and uh, to my former supervisor from University of Sriwijaya, Professor Fakili Gulo, Professor Johnny Bustan, Dr. Bambang Yudono, and some of our college from University of Sao Paulo State, uh, Brazil, Professor Marcelo, Professor Maria, Dr. Pedro, and Dr. Lilian, and also some of our college in, from Vietnam, uh, Dr. Hamin Ngoc, from Vietnam National University, and then some of colleagues from Indonesia, for example, Dr. Chanel from UNS, Dr. Ibutu Mahendra from ITERA, some of co our colleagues from Saihuani in WPI, and then the last one, our mentor, from Dr. Dick Hopman from University of Rostock, Germany. All of the data that I will present today is supported, fully supported by all of the people here, so I want to acknowledge them uh, to, to let me, to give me the permission to uh, share with you today. So let's jump to the main topics. Before I talk more about how get I get inspiration from the photosynthesis to design the, the next level of materials in the future, especially using for energy and environment, I will talk about two main aspects that, based on my perspective, uh, become the main problem right now. The first of all, in the left one, we could say the word uncontrolled world population growth. And then the second one is industrialization. So I could say both of them have the correlation where the industrialization, I'm sorry, I think, yeah. Okay. I think someone tried to control my slide. 
but I think it's moved by itself. So, uh, okay, let's continue. So um, that's the two main aspect that why we have some problem today, especially industrialization and a world a population growth. So what happened when we face these two problem? So we can see now how the carbon dioxide emission uh, bear world region right now. And then we can see starting from 1950, there is a really rapid increase of the CO2 emission. I could say that this is because of the industrialization, world, world population drought. And then uh, we could say that our climate change issue has become very popular in the last 10 years because of this CO2 commission. The carbon dioxide made our uh, earth warmer. So this is the, the, the main issue right now. So the second issue related to the environment is obviously the, uh, the pollution. We could say a lot of our uh, water, water body, for example, the river, the lake, have been com contaminated because of the industri industrialization. There's a lot of solid waste, for example, and then it's become the main concern uh, for us as a researcher to solve this problem. So all of this problem, the CO2 emission, the wastewater and waste problem, possibly turn our green earth become the barren earth. This is not good because we have responsibility to make sure our future generation have the same quality of environment in the future. So we cannot let this happen, the left one happen. So in order to make it sustain, in order to keep the environment, we have to reduce this number of CO2 emission and then we have to solve this problem before i talk more about how to do that uh, i want to say that what happened today in in the world how can we get more waste and how can we get the co2 commission uh, emission because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sorry allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already Predicted in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, number two hundred and five, where Allah say that whenever He attends the authority, He goes about the earth spreading mischief and lying to waste crop and human life, even though Allah doesn't doesn't lo doesn't love mischief. What it mean that in the end of this world, we we believe that the number of people who don't rely on the the religion will be high so when so when the human doesn't follow what god says the earth will, will be misleading meaning that the earth will be destruct will be broken destructive so this is why allah says that in uh in the Quran have been predicted. So how to solve the problem? That's the main idea. How to solve the problem? I want to try to cite some of the uh, Quran also as well. The first is the uh, Quran uh, Surah al alaq Allah said that we have to read. Read meaning, it doesn't mean that we have to read something, for example, like book. I, based on my perspective, read meaning that you have to understand what happened in the, in the, in the nature. And the second one is Surah an nahal chapter number 16, number ayah of uh, 12, where Allah said that specifically mentioned the night and the sun, uh, the night and the day, and specifically the sun, and all of this phenomena uh, become the proof of, for people who understand. I make a red line for sun and proof for people who understand. This is a very interesting why Allah mentioned the sun, uh, the night and the day. There should be some uh, like uh, the the way to solve the problem. And then the last one is uh, in Surah Al-Anam, uh, ch uh, chapter number 6, ayah of uh, 99, where Allah specifically mentioned the vegetation. So all of these this three problems uh, inspired me how to uh, get rid of this problem and then try to give some solution based on what Allah suggested to us. The first is uh, how we have to read the phenomenon in one us that 
what's happening with the with the sunlight and the uh, this, uh, the day and the night and then the the, the third one is the, the plants so all of these three main subject uh, become the base the fundamental aspect uh, to to see the problem uh, to solve the problem what happened in, in the earth right now so before we I talk more about uh, how to get inspired i want to uh, a little bit introduction about uh, introduce a little bit about uh, the industrialization so i could say that we are really strongly depend on the fossil fuel where for example our transportation our electricity is uh, rely on fossil fuel and then all of you will know that so but the climate change like we saw before that the co2 emission keep increasing annually and then we make our earth warm it should be stopped. We should not not completely stop. What but, but we have to reduce the number of CO two com- emission. The the most um, successful ways by substituting sub- substitute the the fossil fuel with the sunlight. This is a very uh, breakthrough in the last ten years, where sunlight become the main uh, research topic, where the scientists try to utilize the sunlight energy. And then we can see, for example, the uh, the solar cell, the founders of solar cell, the last twenty years, also tried to change the landscaping of the electricity production. And then, but however, the the solar cell uh, have the some limitation because the solar cell only produce the electricity. However, our society still use the fossil fuel, for example, to supply the fuel for our transportation and also to feed our chemical industry. So we need, that's the main task. That's our challenge right now. How can we use the sunlight to support our transportation and chemical uh, industry? So talking about the energy itself, we, we know that there is two ways to earn or to, to extract the energy. The first one is the sunlight. Obviously now it's happened, but we usually use the, the fossil fuel which coming from the core of the earth. It's not sustainability, but if you use the sunlight, it's sustainability. And then the other fact that Indonesia itself, as the country where we have the sunlight every single year. So it's also become the advantage if we can uh, develop the science and the technology, we can utilize the sunlight energy to supply our needs. So now what you see is the most successful energy conversion on Earth. This is the main idea about my talk today. Yes, I'm talking about plants. This is also mentioned in the Surah, uh, uh, surah Al-Anam, where the plants is the most successful energy conversion on Earth, and it's already conducted for billion years. Basically, the plants is simply convert the CO2, in our uh, atmosphere to the chemical on demands, for example, glucose, and uh, through the photosynthesis. It's a really simple uh, mechanism, a simple process, but there is more interesting issue. Where we know like right now, for example, the number of uh, forests, number of the plants in the earth is keep reducing by, because of the industrialization and world population growth. So we try to help, we try to find the way how can we mimicking? How can we copy what plants do? So this is why we try to develop a handmade material who can do the photosynthesis using our artificial photosynthesis. This is the main idea. So we can help the plant to convert carbon dioxide to the chemical demands which become our needs. So this is the main idea. So in order to copy what photosynthesis do, we have to understand how the plants do. If we see here, there, are, uh, there is the leaves, the basic fundamental photosynthesis unit. And then if we try to see how the photosynthesis do, we have to magnify 100,000 times. And then we will see the, uh, we will see the, the cells of uh, the, the leaves. So it's called the chloroplast. So the chloroplast itself is not enough to understand the, the how the photo, photosynthesis do. We have to magnify it a hundred times. And then when we do that, we will enter the world of molecular machine, which is the place where the photosynthesis uh, happen. 
talking about the molecular machine, we have to uh, understand how this process, how the photosynthesis uh, conducted. So based on of the, uh, the development, the report by scientists, I think the last eight years, now we can understand how the photosynthesis do. I could uh, make a conclusion that is, there is a three processes where the photosynthesis can do. The first one is the adsorber. In this photosynthesis system, they have the adsorber who can absorb the light from the sunlight and then convert it from the photon energy to the chemical energy. And then after they, after they extract the energy from the sunlight, they will transfer it to the catalysis. This is the protein, the enzyme, and a lot of uh, bio, bio organic substances who convert, for example, the carbon dioxide to the glucose, for example. And then the, ter the third process is the, the system who link between them, the adsorber and the catalysis. So basically, if you want to copy, if you want to mimic what the photosynthesis do, we, have, we can copy what the plants do. But I think it's too complicated. We cannot synthesize a really complicated protein here or we, we, uh, we synthesize the chlorophyll, for example. It's really hard. So in order to copy, in order to make the artificial photosynthesis, we can extract what's the basic or the fundamental aspect of it, uh, the photosynthesis itself. So we could see here, there is an adsorber and there is a catalysis. That's the, the main point that I want to show you today. So this is why we have to design the material or design a substances that can absorb the light and then transfer it to the catalysis and link between them. So if we can successfully design this material, hopefully we can do the artificial, artificial photosynthesis. However, we have to make sure that the material completely absorbs the light or can transfer the energy and do the catalysis. Based on of the, the current uh, progress in material uh, uh, research and development, there is a material we can do uh, the artificial photosynthesis. It's, it is the, it's called the photocatalysis. The photocatalysis itself is a material who can absorb and do the catalysis in one system. This is what I want to talk about today. So the next question is, is it, the material do is it photocatalysis can mimic what the photosynthesis do so in order to test the material some of researcher already uh, tested using the very fundamental aspect of uh, test is the water splitting is this the dream reaction of every single chemist in the world they try to split they try to crack the hydrogen bond between uh, hydrogen and oxygen in water. So if we can break the water, for example, we can generate hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen can we, we use for, for our life and then the hydrogen can we use and, as the renewable energy source in the future. So in this research, I, I cite from one of the professor from uh, un, University UNSW, Australia, who successfully report the use of photocatalysis to split the water. So as you can see here, there is no light, there's no reaction, but when there is a light, there's a bubble, meaning that the water that we use here, when they contact with the catalysis and they illuminate the catalysis, there is a production of hydrogen and oxygen. This water splitting is a really stepping stone, really break to founding in the photocatalysis. So we cannot satisfied with this founding. We have to back to the basic aim of the research where we need to convert the carbon dioxide. So, okay. so in order to understand the, the mechanism, how the material can do, we, we need to understand the basic knowledge the molecular machine of this photocatalysis, we need to, to understand the quantum mechanics of the material. So in, in order to understand that, we need to know how the materials can do. So in this, I, I have, I tried to, uh, try to, to explain it's really simple. So basically when we have the material, it has the, elect 
the, the smallest uh, substances in the material. So the electron will be in the ground state. So when there is a light, yeah, I'll try. So um, yeah, when, when there's a light, and then we, we can see that when the light hits the material, it's extract, it's excite the electron from the ground state to the excitement state and leaving the hole in the ground state. And these two phenomena initiate the reduction site and the oxidation site. Oxidation site. This reduction site and the oxidation site then do what the water splitting do. And then I could, I, because the limited of time, these two basic knowledge can do the photosynthesis itself. Beside of the photosynthesis, our artificial photosynthesis can do a much more complicated, much more application. For example, in this COVID uh, era, a lot of researchers report that using the photocatalysis as the antibacterial surface in the mass, so the mass can have the antibacterial, so it can prevent more COVID-19. The other thing is self-cleaning and then super hydrophobic uh, 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 surfaces. And it's also applied in some city, for example, in Rome, in Italy, where the in the future, if you, if you paint a building, you don't have to clean it. You don't have to do painting again because it can do the self-cleaning. It can clean by itself. The second one, using the air purifier where the photocatalysis is used to, for example, in the curtains or in the AC, in the tunnel, where when they, they are air pollution enter the room, they can, uh, sorry, they can uh, purify the, the air. Uh, it's also the solar wastewater where, where people try to use uh, a photocatalyst to degrade the air, uh, wastewater here. And then after that, what we do uh, recently, we try to develop a new material which can specifically utilize the visible because if you, we talk about the sunlight, the UV light is only 4% and mostly it's visible. But mostly the material who reported recently, it's only absorb the UV light. And then we successfully uh, develop it using the material uh, SNO2, SNO, SN3O4, and etc. Uh, etc. Et reports is already published in, in some a really good journal and then we successfully synthesize the material and then try to solve the environmental problem for example how to degrade the the, the pollution this is some uh, basic chemistry and we also try to use some uh, artificial like computational uh, chemistry to see how we can develop the further uh, material in the future so in conclusion, I want to say that um, we have successfully mimicking, we have successfully copy what the plants do in order to convert the car carbon dioxide to the chemical on demand. But what we do is much more uh, successful, I, I could say, because plants only can convert the carbon dioxide uh, 1% by every single photosynthesis, but our artificial photosynthesis can do a lot more. We are not only can convert the carbon dioxide, but we can also do the water splitting, we can produce the, the future uh, green uh, renewable energy in the future. We also can do, for example, uh, uh, producing the methanols, the plant. hear the words from God that when human doesn't follow what God says, it will, uh, we will be, the world will be disrupted. There's many keywords actually in the Al-Quran for the solutions to science and technology, um, which basically comes from plant and the sun, such as uh, copying what plants do, such as uh, photosynthesis. Um, thank you very much, Doctor. We'll move on to our second speak, keynote speaker.
We have a wonderful dean here with us, lecturing at Universitas Gajah Mada, known as UGM, who is always inventing great industrial ideas in the field of biology. Professor Budi Satyadi Daryono obtained his master and doctoral degrees in 2002 and 2005 from the Tokyo University of Agriculture, Japan, following undergraduate studies at uh, UGM. In 2012 to 2016, he became Vice Dean for Academic and Student Affairs at the Faculty of Biology, UGM, and from 2017 to present, he serves as the Dean of the Faculty of Biology, UGM. He's lecturing for several subjects related to genetics and mole molecular from 1996 to present. In 2019, he received his professorship in genetics and breeding at the Faculty of Biology, Universitas Gajah Mada. He is currently a member of UGM Academic uh, Senate, uh, SAB. R A O N I S S A A S. He's also active as researcher focusing on genetics and breeding, trainer in training, participant in scientific activities and society membership. He has achieved 14 awards, most recently the best UGM Science and Technology Cluster Collaborative Research Award in 2020. His current research interests are in plant breeding, animal breeding, molecular phylogenetic marker, and gene inheritance. The importance of species population trends will be the theme for his session as they are considered as a measure of overall health ecosystem. Thank you, Professor Budi, for being here with us. We would like to uh, uh, please give the time for you. Thank you, Dr. Can you hear my voice nicely? Okay. This Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi and good morning. Again, thanks moderator for this opportunity. And it is uh, my honor to join the Aceh International Conference on Science and Technology, or uh, you, you say this, ACOS, held by the faculty of uh, science and technology in Araniri Aceh. Before I talk, the Honorable Rector of UIN Araniri, my friend also the Dean of Faculty of uh, Science and Technology UIN Araniri, as well as uh, Dr. Abdul Muzadid Hamdan, the Chairman of the, the Committee, and also uh, Dr. Andri Huda, the first keynote speaker who's already delivered and nicely his talk in this morning. So um, I would like now to uh, share my slide. Wait a moment. So I, I hope everything will be uh, nicely uh, presented. And then can you see my, my slide? So my talks today is about the, the contribution and also the effort of the Indonesian Biology Consortium, or we call COBI, in bending the curve of Indonesia biodiversity loss. As um, I'm a, as a, a chairman of Consortium Biology Indonesia, or Indonesian Biology Consortium, so um, before I talk, I also would like to introduce you briefly about my institution. Here is... Uh, the location of Gajah Mada University in Java Island, in the province of uh, Yogyakarta, special province. And here you can see the graduation uh, ceremony building, and this is the main building. As you know, the UGM is the biggest um, and the oldest state university in Indonesia. Is, uh, this year it will become 72 years. And we have uh, more than 55,000 students, including graduate and undergraduate students. And 18 faculties and two school, the vocational school and also the graduate uh, school. And among 18 uh, faculty, you can see here, um, this is the faculty of biology, faculty of every one of the uh, among 18 faculty in UGM. 
And these faculties already accredited internationally by ASIM uh, from German for undergraduate program until 2023. And also for the master, we already uh, certified by Asian University Network. And uh, maybe next year, we will also join with the ASIM as in the study program for undergraduate. And here's the new building uh, if you go to uh, UGM, you will find this building. This is uh, one of the building in our faculty, faculty of biology. Now I would like to share you the outline. I would like to talk about the introduction because some of you maybe do not uh, well known about the Indonesian biology consortium or COBI. So I would like to share you the history goals and membership. And also the summary of Leaping Planet report and current the condition of Indonesia biodiversity and COBI X and contribution. And the, the, the last is a uh, conclusion. May I ask the admin can stop uh, some, somebody maybe wrote it in uh, my uh, slide. Maybe you can give the limited access for others. And then I move to the COBI. Um, this is the history of the COBI. So COBI was established, uh, founded in Yogyakarta uh, in September 22 in 2011. So almost now at 10 years, four under the mind, the period. Uh, COBI also play an active role in the development of higher education in biology and control of biodiversity for optimal and sustainable utilization of biological natural resources for human welfare and also environment sustainability. As you know, that Indonesia is uh, one of the superpower for uh, biodiversity and we call also as mega biodiversity countries. If we combine the terrestrial and the marine biodiversity, uh, Indonesia is number one, the biggest country for biodiversity in, in the world. And this is the uh, Kobe school. We have uh, three goals. As you can see here, so uh, the first is gathering higher education institution in the field of biology, both government and also the private. That's why maybe UIN a biology study program, UIN Araniri also uh, as a member of the COBI. And communicating, cooperating, and synergizing with institutions engaged in biology and related fields, both at home and abroad. We have many uh, collaboration with uh, uh, abroad, the, the, some of university from Europe, Australia, as well as also another Asian country. And the third is assisting the government because we are is NGO, non-government organization. So in the development of various sectors of life related to field of biology. As you see here that uh, Kobe already uh, have the legal status. Yeah, the, the Kobe was officially registered at the uh, Ministry of uh, Law and Human Rights of Indonesia since 2014. And also we have a letter, the statement letter for, from uh, Professor Dr. Intan Ahmad. Uh, she wa he was uh, Director of General of Belmawa uh, in Higher Education, Ministry of Higher Education, um, and which state that the COBI is an association uh, of biology study program in Indonesia, and which obviously exists and has a legal status. You can see here the, the, the letters from the directors uh, of general higher general education at the time. And how about the members of the COBI? So we have uh, uh, by March 2021, we have uh, around 365 study program, I think including biology Uinaranari. And the biggest is of course in Java, we have more than 136 study programs yeah, uh, as a member of the COBI. And the second is in Sumatra Island. We have a 88 uh, study program here. And the third, I think, in uh, Sulawesi, yeah? in Celebes, Sulawesi. We have a 42 uh, study program. And next is uh, Kalimantan, 35, and Bali, and East Timor, and West uh, Timor, 
have 27 and move to Malox have 21 and the last is Papua we have uh, around seven uh, study program as a member of uh, you can imagine we have uh, through this uh, country we have a 36 five study program as a member to manage our biodiversity and then I uh, move now to how about the international condition uh, as I uh, said to you but we are very happy we have uh, a country which uh, mega biodiversity but uh, this is not only uh, opportunity for us and also advantages but also we have these advantages if we are couldn't manage uh, nicely the our biodiversity and here is i would like to share you the summary leaping planet report last year as uh, already reported by uh, wwf and they are reported in leaping planet report and we see here uh, so the condition our condition now in in the world uh, in the global 2020 so we see uh, the index show and the average of uh, 68 uh, percent fall in monetary population of mama including the birds also amphibian reptile and also fish and you can see here uh, start from uh, 1970 until 2016 so we have uh, decreased our uh, population yeah uh, our species population is around 68 uh, percent why we are emphasis the species population trend so because the species population are very important they are a measure for overall ecosystem health if we see that the species population getting worse it's mean all of ecosystem health also uh, getting bad so um this is important for us to pay attention how the species population uh, uh, getting well because this is also to replace to express the ecosystem health and now we move to the condition for each uh, uh, continent yeah and any region so if we see here overall the condition in every region area is declined you see here in uh, europe also and here uh, and in North America, including US and Canada, and also in Africa, as well as in Asia. But we can see here the most uh, decline region is in uh, South American tropics. Yeah, the sub region of the America is a more more shrinking result of any region. So they said it's around ninety. 4% decline in the living planet uh, index. It means the, the species uh, population index also decrease. Compared to Indonesia, maybe Indonesia also decreased, but uh, I think um, short America is also uh, getting worse because uh, the massive of destruction, mainly in the forest. And you see the conversion of uh, ecosystem and the upper exploitation of species to uh, make uh, climate change. and the induction of alien species are the key driver to decline uh, our uh, planet condition. And I want to share you the data from freshwater. So we see the almost 90 percent of uh, global wetland have been lost also seen in 70 uh, and thousand and you see these here uh, they are declined until 84 percent yeah and 1944 species of mama birds amphibian reptile and fishes in freshwater declined four percent every year four percent every year and since uh, 1970 and so this is the end this indicated that the freshwater is the fed the fastest ecosystem decline and now after freshwater i move to the soil how about soil soil also is very very important if we want to see the the soil house is one of the largest 
reservoir of biodiversity on the earth. And we see without soil biodiversity, terrestrial ecosystem may collapse. Here, the soil community see the megafauna in, uh, in the ground or in the surface of our soil. And then in uh, differ, we can see the macrofauna, mesofauna, and also the microbe and, my, uh, and other microfauna. And up to 70% of living organism in terrestrial ecosystem, including us, uh, including the, uh, some pollinator, and also spend part of their life cycle in this area, in the soil uh, habitats. After fresh water, soil I move into the marine. How about marine? Marine also we have a problem, the big problem, because the loss of marine biodiversity is weakening to the ocean ecosystem and its ability also to withstand this disturbance and to adapt to climate change. And also the most important to play its role a global ecological and climate regulator. But now we can see the overfishing, the pollution, the coastal development, and also uh, the small water to the deep sea and the climate change also will continue to cause a growing spectrum of effect across marine ecosystem. And this is also uh, very hard, uh, uh, including to Indonesia, because we see the, the fishing also now in Greece, uh, the land-based pollution, also the ocean-based pollution, the coastal development, also the invasive alien species from abroad and offshore infrastructure, including shipping and marine hunter and the deep sea mining. So um, marine, I think uh, our ocean now is in hot water. And we move to plant uh, diversity. So because in Terrestria, they, we have seen the plant diversity is in serious decline. And we see the plant extinction risk is comparable to the death of mammal and higher than for the bird. But the number of the documented plant extinction is twice as uh, in the mammal, birds, and an amphibian combined. Why? Because uh, plants cannot move directly. So they are not as like animal can move. So uh, the, uh, the extinction is twice, as many as for uh, animals. In addition, an assessment of sample thousands of species also representing the taxonomy and the geographical breadth of the global diversity and this is so that one in five, or around 22%, are treated with extinction, most of them in, in the tropic, in our, in our area. And now we see the condition of the global. You see that the gross domestic product also increased, GDP, and also the, uh, the urban population, as well as the total population, maybe. Uh, now is reached to 8 billion people in the world. But, uh, and also because of the child mortality rate is going down. Um, but here, if we are not uh, be careful, also we still face the climate change. This is the also big risk to our biodiversity because the impact, even the climate change pressure, uh, besides have the, uh, the positive impact, but also the mechanism of negative impact is very serious. So we can see the impacts on species, the change in population distribution and genetic characteristic lead to the altered vulnerability and also to extinction. So, and then how to manage this one? I think we have to make a balancing. For example, here we can see the intrinsically and interlink between the healthy planet and healthy people. You see, the biodiversity also is fundamental to food security. And this is the food security be uh, between the livelihood, usually based on domestication, and also the resilience, usually based on the wild. And also, the food security is including integrated uh, using the terrestrial plant, terrestrial animal, including also the aquatic animal and plants, and as well as in microorganism and and also the fungi. And now the scenario. We see uh, we have uh, 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 at least three or uh, four 
uh, six or four scanner, the big scanner for the uh, people and nature. And one modeling can we project in the bending of the curve. So we see in this model, the human population week uh, around 90.4 billion is almost maybe 10 billion by 2070. So and then in, if uh, the growth is moderate and uneven and the globalization continue, so we have uh, six scenario here. Uh, you can see the, the curve here in uh, 2010. And if we are not uh, have the effort, the curve is will be going down here. And there are many extinction and destruction in the world. And but if we have the good scenario, for example, we increase the conservation effort only. So it will be increased also the curve, the bending the curve and the grow up. And also the, the second scanner is the more sustainable production, the supply side report, or uh, we, we see here, I'm sorry, uh, here, the, 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 not the green, but this is the, uh, I think, um, <laughs> what we call ungu, yeah? Yeah, the, the, the purple, the purple one. And also if uh, the, uh, the green, uh, young green here, so this is the more sustainable consumption, the demand side effort, and this is will be reduced. And the last, the best is also the, the combination, I think, the integrated uh, portfolio between the, the increase of the conservation and also sustainable production, as well as the sustainable consumption. So maybe it will be getting better. So the critical point in 2025, yeah. So we have to abandon it and then to increase the uh, recovery of our our living world here. And now I move to, how about Indonesia? You are know very well, we have a mega biodiversity country, and we ha have the first, uh, uh, the first richness of coral in the world. We have uh, more than uh, 590 species of the coral, and we have also the second of mama in the world. We have uh, five. 115 species and we have also the third place of the plant in the world because of 37,000 species here in Indonesia and number four is because of the primate and also the reptile and number five because of the richness of the world and the last is because of the richness of the amphibian so but this is not enough for us because we also have a big problem with here so if you see the data is between 220 well it's more than six million hectares of primary forest i think including in Aceh and these areas uh, similar to the england is also destroying our biodiversity and then if we see the 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 the, the data in kalimantan is you you see very easily to to see the the change of the uh, forest is to become disappear is more than 28 million of Indonesian forests. And this is uh, 70, 77 of them uh, were virgin forests. And in the term of local trip, like in the ocean, we also can uh, see the more than half of our coral reef described this as high to very high freedom. So we, we have to move it. How Indonesia have to, uh, to uh, uh, give solution for this uh, problem? So actually, we have also ratified the uh, CBD Convention on Biodiversity, and also this is UN, and also we have ratified the uh, Kyoto Protocol. Uh, we have some conservation district like in 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 Kalimantan. We have uh, uh, the established in including the Kapuas Hulu, Malinau, as well as also in the Kuningan and Pasir um, District. Yeah. And even we also include in environmental impact assessment. And uh, fortunately, we also have Indonesia Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, or IPSA. Uh, and then Kobe also has uh, working together with Papanas to, uh, to uh, make a plan for the post-2020 IPSA. And why I said by 2050, and this is very important for us, because this is the, uh, I already said in the previous slide, 
this is the uh, the critical point for the situation of the uh, bending curve of uh, our biodiversity because without the management of biodiversity if we, we will have the uh, the big problem for for this earth not only for indonesia yeah and then i move to the kobe x and contribution kobe is a non-government organization and also we would like to uh to strengthen our biodiversity and we also try to have many acts and contribution the first contribution of uh, kobe so kobe every biennial or two years we have the coordinating meeting now is the third maybe in 2016 the first kobe uh, national meeting con or congress held in uh uin uh, alaudin makassar uh, uin alaudin is the first of the uh, meeting and the second in Universitas Surabaya in Surabaya and the last in Universitas Bengkulu and next year this year we will have our uh, national meeting in Papua in Unipa uh, Manokwari West Papua and we also here oh, yeah, in the meeting yeah, we, we discuss about the stuff uh, to develop uh, and implement the program, program, program so we in the management, management of natural resources. resources. And the second, and the we also second very active in uh, producing or uh, writing the opinion in newspaper, uh, not only in national, but also in international journal uh, regarding the Indonesian biodiversity condition and also the index. You can see here, so my paper in the sub one of the international journal talking about the the, the, the condition when uh, we have the problem with Indonesian coral damaged by uh, one of the crash in maybe in two or three years ago. And also I wrote many uh, opinion in the national newspaper because I think biodiversity is not yet priority for Indonesia. Even we but have Professor from, Budi, uh, okay. I, would, I would like to remind you that the time is um, almost up. Can you please finish up in five minutes? Okay. Is enough. Also, we have developed of the study program of biology and C. Also, uh, I thought also biology in Bahrain we also will improve their uh, uh, accreditation. Yeah? As you see, this, uh, this data is most of our uh, biology study program, uh, a member of the COBE increased their quality in accreditation, not only national accreditation, but also international accreditation. And the most important is number four. So COBE is the one of the Indonesian, um, uh, Indonesian cooperation and uh, uh, committee or to have already uh, successfully uh, make a national standard biology curriculum, as you see here, since uh, did not only for undergraduate program, but also we also make the national standard biology curriculum for uh, postgraduate program. And the last also, I think we also are working together with the young uh, generation. We also working together with Ikatan Himbunan Mahasiswa Biology or Indonesia or UKMB and working with social media because Indonesia also have more than 150 million people now uh, are using the social media. And Kobe also very active in implementing independent learning program in independent campus we call MBKM and we have se several seminar series yeah. and also Kobe also organizing the several course related to uh, bio creators yeah and SDGs and the provision of and the big data analysis for biodiversity in Indonesia. And uh, since 2019, Kobe has given the first biodiversity award to uh, individual or a group who have contributed significantly to the presentation and conservation of Indonesia biodiversity. You can see the video. This is only maybe two minutes. Yeah. Dalam rangka memperingati Hari Cinta Puspa dan Satwa Nasional 2019 yang jatuh pada 5 November lalu, organisasi yang berperan aktif dalam pengembangan ilmu biologi dalam bidang keanekaragaman hayati dan pemanfaatan sumber daya alam hayati Indonesia atau yang lebih dikenal dengan Kobi, memberikan penghargaan sosok keanekaragaman hayati kepada Mendiang Ani Yudhoyono. Ketua Kobi Budi Setiadi mengatakan, 
Penghargaan diberikan kepada Ibu Negara RI ke-6 sebagai bentuk penghormatan atas dedikasi dan jasa-jasa mendiang semasa hidupnya dalam memperjuangkan kelestarian keanekaragaman hayati di Indonesia. Ada banyak masukan, yang pertama adalah beliau tentu kita sudah tahu adalah Ibu Negara ya. Kemudian juga beliau mempunyai concern yang sangat tinggi, Sidak, jadi sebelum jadi Ibu Negara, kita lihat track recordnya, beliau memiliki kecintaan terhadap lingkungan yang cukup tinggi. Sementara itu, SBY dan putra sulungnya Agus Harimurti Yudhoyono mengapresiasi atas penghargaan yang telah diberikan kepada Mendiang Ani Yudhoyono atas komitmen dan aksi nyatanya dalam melestarikan lingkungan hidup dan keanekaragaman hayati. 43 tahun kami bersama dengan Ibu Ani. Oleh karena itu, saya mengerti apa yang ada dalam hatinya, apa yang ada dalam pikirannya, dan apa yang dilakukan selama puluhan tahun jauh sebelum menjadi ibu negara di negeri tercinta ini. Di dunianya saya kira almarhumah hari ini tersenyum, damai, bahagia, dan juga mengucapkan terima kasih. Tentunya mengucapkan terima kasih dan penghargaan yang tinggi atas apresiasi yang diberikan kepada almarhumah Ibu Ani atas segala karya dan juga komitmen sepanjang hidupnya untuk lingkungan hidup. Dengan adanya penghargaan ini, diharapkan dapat memicu seluruh masyarakat Indonesia, terutama generasi penerus, untuk mampu menjaga keanekaragaman hayati yang dimiliki Indonesia. And then the last is uh, Kobe also together with several uh, institution, ministry and government agency. So like here you see the KLHK, HKP, and then Ministry of Education also, Ristek Brin or LIPI also, and we all work together with uh, very strongly with BAPENAS and BPS also, as well as the Ministry of Finance, KMNQ, yeah, to uh, support and to compiling the Indonesian Biodiversity Index. And this is also, we expected this year, maybe we implemented the Indonesian Biodiversity Index. We could due to the lack of the time. I clearly I have uh, more another uh, video, but I think uh, due to the limited of time, I will uh, close this my presentation by uh, the three or four uh, statement in the conclusion. The first, humans are very dependent on the nature, but in fact now we are contribute to destroying our nature too and we call Anthropocene. And the second, the global and national biodiversity trend in Indonesia, now we see the show decrease, both in quality and quantity. That's why Kobe are uh, very active in how we can bend the bending, the curve for the biodiversity loss in Indonesia. And the third is social media. We can be used as a medium for mainstreaming biodiversity issue in Indonesia since you see that we have more than 150 million people, uh, mainly is young generation, using the social media. So we will use the social media for mainstreaming biodiversity issue in Indonesia. And the last is Kobe. We have a commitment and network to work together to realize the CBD 2050 vision, including working together, including here, I'm here today uh, in biology, uh, Faculty of Science and Technology in Araniri because of we will uh, strengthen our uh, network and also our collaboration with all of uh, Indonesia and also uh, as well as in the board. Thanks so much and uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I return back to the moderator. Thank you. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Professor Budi. Such an enlightening speech it has raised our awareness on uh, the importance of our ecosystem where there is a decline of our biodiversity worldwide uh, that is threatening our ecosystem. Uh, thank you. We will now move on to the first Q&A session. Uh, are there anyone in the room who would like to ask um, questions directly to Dr. Huda and Professor Budi? You can click on the raise hand icon on your screen so that we can spot you easier. Easy. Easy. 
All right, we have one question here from uh, uh, Faizia, is it? Yes, it's Miss. Suaranya dia udah resen. Ya, Bu Fezia. Halo. 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 Ini. Oke, okay. thank you, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you for giving me time to ask questions to the speakers. Uh, I'm so sorry because I can't uh, turn on my uh, video here. Um, I have a question to. Mr. Huda, Bapak Huda. Ini ini Pak Huda? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Um thank you very much for giving uh, such uh, a very interesting topic about the artificial photosynthesis. Um uh I have a questions but maybe this is a general questions uh, because uh, in the last slide you didn't well, show your slide maybe in detail. So, uh, my question is: How is your uh, research application to real life, uh, maybe in the for economic perspective or other perspective? Maybe you can explain more about your research application. So, I want to hear more about the your research. Yeah. That is my question, so thank you. Pak Huda and Fitri. Halo. Okay, thank you so much for Ms. Faiza for the question. So right now we are focusing because the trends not right now is focusing on how to how we can optimize uh, to utilize the sunlight for example because the sunlight is mostly consists of visible light instead of the UV light so most of the material who have been applied for example in the building in the glass it's only can be activated by UV light so so far because um, our main role here as a scientist, they try, we try to develop the, the material. So basically for, for right now, uh, we don't have any specifically study about how the, the economy impact on it, because mostly we just try to, to develop the material, the performance of the material. So if, if we want to, uh, to see the economic perspective of my, my perspective again, I could say that uh, the photocatalysis is really uh, interesting because, for example, the uh, if you read some papers, uh, they already applied the material in paint uh, to to coloring the building, for example, and then it, it can uh, save almost forty to sixty percent of the cost, where the the, the paint can do the self cleaning, where the paint, for example, if they are in the road, is mostly like get polluted get contaminated, for example, by soil. And then because of the self-cleaning properties, the material can clean all of the dust, the soil on the surface of the building. But I don't, to be specific, you ask me if our group have been uh, studying about the economic impact of this material. We don't do that for now. But uh, because we are focused more in, in science behind on the material, yeah, we hopefully we can 
in the future we can try to to see the economy economic perspective is it the material really uh, can uh, improve the the quality of uh, environment for example is it the the, uh, the cost is really high that so should be the, the the challenge for now but i could say that for now the most interesting part is to develop improve the performance of the material how i hope that it can answer your question Thank you very much for the question um, from Nanda. I think, uh, like, like, uh, like I talked before, if we focus on a carbon dioxide uh, conversion, this material obviously can help what the plants do. But to substitute, to change the role of plants to balance the ecosystem, I think uh, it's not worth it. Because beside as the CO2 or sorry CO2 conversion, the plant has more uh, the other function, which is a more uh, important. For example, to sustain the biodiversity, to to keep the the environmental uh, aspect and etc. So, but if you ask about the uh, CO2 conversion, uh, it can it can help, not substitute. We still rely on the plants. We still rely on the vegetation, the forest, to um, to reduce the number of CO two. But again, because the 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 produce the production of CO two emission is really high, and that the number of forests keep reduce uh, annually, so we need to do something to help the environment. This is the one of the the most promising uh, methods that we can do to help uh, the 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 earth reduce or reduce the number of the uh, carbon dioxide emission. Hopefully that could be answered. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, I have a question to Dr. Huda, it's nice to hear the, your explanation about artificial photosynthesis. From there, we are increasingly aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best creator and nature is the greatest inspiration for mankind. Uh, Dr. Huda, can you share with us what is the important step for us as scientists to interpret a play and bring the various events in nature to laboratory activity or indus industrial application. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I didn't get uh, the basic uh, question that you want to ask, like how can we learn from the nature to apply in the industrialization? Is it correct? Hello? Yes, Dr. Huda. Uh, it's also very uh, many various, various uh, even in nature. How, as scientists, how we can, uh, important step for us as scientists to interpret uh, and then apply or bring the various even nature to laboratory activity or industrial application. Okay, thank you so much. So I got it. I try to answer. So if in order to, like I said before, like in order to start, this is uh, what I, I have done before in order to, to looking for the idea, idea what can we do? 
I normally see what what's happening in our surroundings, for example, the sun, the nature, the sun, the plants, the sun, the sun, the sun. If you want to ask me in general, how can we do that? We can see how the nature system works to sustain maybe the, the, the environmental degradation or our, um, our, the energy sectors, etc. For example, if we want... Let, let's say if we can let's say if we want to if we want solve the environmental pollution environmental pollution to be more specifically uh, there is an oil spill in the water spill in the water they try to use the bio uh, degradation molecules so i think uh, by understanding we have the advantage because we can understand in, 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 in Islamic ways um, or in religion ways and then connect it to the science and technology. So you have the valid uh, reference, which is maybe Al-Quran or the other uh, religion uh, holy book, for example. Maybe you can start by exploring what Al-Quran says and, and try to understand the nature, for example. So by by combining understanding the Quran, the reference that I, I believe we believe uh, as as a as a good uh, a believer, so we believe that uh, the Al Quran already completely mentioned all of the suggestion, all of the methods to solve the problem that we face today. But again, like I told before, when we when we try to get out from the what God's explained to us, uh, we will face the the world destroyed. So, so again, back to the basic, we have to see what uh, our, our Quran says, for example, and then try to understand the 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 nature by by read by understanding how the nature balance the ecosystem. Hopefully, it could, it could answer. Um, we do have a question now for Professor Budi from Rizna Rahmi. Uh, the question is, is it the introduced species, non-native, non-invasive, especially plant species, will always cause detrimental effect for the native species and natural ecosystem, and how it will actually affect the biodiversity? To Professor Budi. You may answer the question. Nowadays, because of the global market and also global um, trading, as well as movement, very easy for the people from the one place to another place. And also influence the invasive species uh, spread over the world. Um, maybe 100 years ago, it's difficult to um, bring our plant um, to Europe, for example, because of the, the transportation is not so supported like us today. And when we uh, uh, have the introduction, introduce species, for example, plant or animal, this is also will affect the unbalanced, um, unbalanced uh, ecosystem here. For example, when the frog, the big frog from uh, Amazon area, found in one of the river in Yogyakarta. What happened? Many of um, local frog eat by the biggest frog in the world from Brazil, now in, in Yogyakarta. And also they not only eat the frog, the local frog, they also eat everything, including uh, local uh, fish and, and so on. Um, because of the size of the uh, biggers, this frog also eat one of the natural uh, enemy, or uh, like, uh, uh, for example, snake. Yeah. And if we are not control this, many of our local species will disappear and threaten. So uh, maybe some of hobbies do not think um, away from this effect this advantage is when we introduce the species to our country. And also, if we see some of our weeds now, we call in Bahasa Gulma, this actually originated not from our country. Most of weed in Indonesia found here now 
is also introduced from some countries. And I'm working on also in plant virus. And I see nowadays the begum virus increase in overall in Indonesia because we also uh, do not pay attention for the insect introduction to Indonesia. So the insects introduced to Indonesia may be through uh, plants or through maybe uh, uh, fruits, maybe. And then after Indonesia, there will be a big problem as a factor, as a factor for the virus uh, replication. And now we, we are uh, in a very difficult condition because the biogomopers can infect more than 15 family, different family of the plant and for as a result there is so many fail for the harpers for example in the, the cucurbit harpers in the solanaceous harpers and in many of the agriculture production so the most important for us is we have to uh, pay attention and also increase the quality the guard quality for example for plant and animal protection section in indonesia and to make the uh, very uh, strict regulation like in uh, Australia and also in New Zealand, they're working very hard to protect their country from the uh, invasive species, including this, the disease. Like uh, we now, we got the corona because of we are not paying attention at the first level uh, when this uh, disease has spread. And because of also the, the global uh, communication, the global transportation, the global movement movement very easy now. That's why if uh, we also get the the, the the disease, it's also more easily to spread from one region to another region. So my suggestion, please we are uh, pay attention and also uh, learn some uh, protection tool. For example, if we uh, receive the invasive species or maybe another species from abroad, Please, you are registered and also you report it to the uh, plant or animal uh, protection section in your district. And after that, there will be control and do not spread the because we do not uh, understand for the future how the bad impact of this uh, plant or animal to our ecosystem. Thank you very much. Hello, moderators. Yes, you may address your question to Professor Budi. Uh, thank you. Thank um, you. Um, I would like to I'll send this send session to Mr. Brian Wei. Uh, okay. 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 Uh, Mr. Huda, I would like to, to ask a simple question. Uh, what is the weakness of this photocatalytic system? Because uh, I don't think we can produce or create or make a very 100% uh, perfect things as a human and uh, is there any side product it will produce or is there any side effect for the environment for example or is it photocatalytic system will only work perfectly 100% as uh, we want that is my question what is the, the weakness or the side effect of this photocatalytic system thank you Thank you so much for the question. Um, so talking about the weakness, like I say that the photocatalysis strongly depends on the light photocatalysis. So meaning without the photo, without the light, there is no reaction. So that's the main challenge. We doesn't want to work only on the daylight. We want to create a system that also work during the night. So that's the challenge. How can we create a system that sustainably or continuously work even in day or even in the, in the night. So the challenge. The second one, 
if we, uh, I, I don't have any opportunity to explain about the quantum mechanics, that's the fundamental aspects. If we can see that in the previous slide that I told before, that it's depend on the electrons transfer. So the reaction can do if the electron can excite from the ground state to the excited, uh, ex uh, excited state, or from lumo to humo to lumo to humo in the organic chemistry, for example. So we have to make sure that an electron can jump from the ground state to the excited state. If the electron cannot jump because of the low light intensity, for example, or the electron which already excited come back to the ground state. It's, it can be possible. So it makes the catalysis cannot do any single reaction. So that's the challenge. How can we engineer the system who can tap the excited electron so they, they cannot come back to the ground state? That's the challenge. The second one uh, is the photocatalysis. If it released to the environment, for example, in the river, and that it exposed with the light. It can degrade all of the substances. Either it's good for environment or it's bad for environment. Because the photocatalytic is not something like bio biological uh, agent who can, which can specify, specify uh, degrade some pollutants and then save for the environment. So no, the photocatalysis, they can degrade all of the substances in the environment. So we could say, if it's released to the environment and then it's contact with something like, like a good microbiology or a good, uh, enver like for, uh, for example, some uh, alga or some organic substances, it can also effect, give the negative effect because it can degrade, it's completely degrade everything which contact with it. So that's the, 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 the answer, I think. Uh, hopefully it can answer the question. Thank you so much. to uh, say that we are very limited in time, so we will now close the question and answer session. Um, thank you very much to Professor Budi for being here today with us, and thank you also to Dr. Huda. It would truly be an honor if you can stay for the keynote sessions, but we also understand if you need to leave due to differences of time in your country, especially for Dr. Huda. I think it's probably quite late there in Massachusetts. Uh, we don't want you to be late tomorrow for work. So once again, thank you for both of you. We will be having more excellent speakers ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. innovation and invention exposed and she has much more to offer to the society to her country in Malaysia and to us as well today according to the theme of today's conference she is an excellent expert in her field now today she will be talking about the role of artificial intelligence AI as an important data analytic tools in predicting the patterns of dynamic and unexpected COVID-19 databases uh, to Dr. Norma Elias please the time is yours All right. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, uh, thank you to uh, Miss Chair. Okay, I want to show me Sadri, Wayasiri, Amri, Wahlu, Ufadatan, Nilisani, Yaqahu, Awli. Right, thank you very much to the uh, the um, chair of the organizing committee okay, of 
Oikos 2021, okay, uh, Dr. Abdul Mujahid Hamdan, and the respecting Dean of Faculty of Science and Technology, okay, Dr. H. Azhar Ansal, and the uh, respected uh, Rector, okay, uh, Yuin R. Ranwi, Professor Dr. Warul Walidin, and others uh, organizing community, as I know, Pak Bukan Fadil, and all of you, welcome to uh, the first okay, um, conference on science and technology uh, from uh, Aceh. Right? So, thank you very much for um, sharing or for inviting me at this conference. All right? So, let's I uh, share with you okay, the presentation of my talk today, Improving Post-Pandemic Environment Through Science and Technology. So since okay, I'm from Mathematics Department, so I would like to share some uh, research outcome, how I describe COVID-19 pandemic in Malaysia based on predictive model of machine learning strategy, right? So this is my uh, topic uh, that uh, I think uh, will be influencing you because nowadays we are new norm pandemic, right? So this is a University Technology Malaysia. So our vision for 2025 is to provide sustainable campus experience okay, to UTM students, staff and surrounding community. So it means that since you are in the pandemic, Everything in education 4.0, everything run in um, industrial uh, revolution 4.0. So uh, we are all in virtual environment, right? So for today, okay, I would like to share with you the content of my talk on what is a data type, okay? Why we deal with the data during the COVID-19 pandemic, during uh, for industrial revolution how the COVID-19 outbreak okay, for the selected country, what is the research methodology for mission learning techniques, and uh, what is the example of some mission learning techniques, how to implement, and then how this okay, uh, technique can produce a good predictive model and result, and some conclusion. All right, so now, we start with the COVID-19 virus, okay? You are quite familiar with the virus, okay? And then there are so many cases, okay? People have a COVID-19 disease and, you know, what happened to their lung, all right? So you can see here, there are a few stages of the ground glasses, okay? Ground glass region at the lung. There are type A, B, C, and D, all right? So the ground glasses, covered the region of the lung so what happened the people have sick okay there is one of the serious disease in malaysia all right let's we go to the uh, other cases in um uh, countries okay uh, successful countries for example united states russia china uk and singapore all right you can see here all the cases is decreasing Okay, from April 2021, and then how about Singapore? Okay, from November 2020, and then how about UK? Is uh, April 2021, all right? So what happened to my country? Okay, let's go. what happened to my country. All right, Malaysia, okay, we still not predict, okay, the new cases, the pandemic, COVID-19 in my country. How about other countries, for example, uh, India, all right, you can see here. All right, they, they, they also cannot be predicted, but in June 2021, the, the number of cases decreasing. How about Indonesia? I know you quite uh, know the cases in your country, but till June 2013, the graph is uh, same as uh, Malaysia, cannot be predicted. And how about Japan? Japan also, okay, till June 2021, okay, they are uh, up and down. So this is a motivation for my research, okay, 
to investigate what happened to our country. All right. So in this case, since you are work at home, you are stay at home, but we have a data. So let's we go to the data analysis to do uh, inspecting, cleaning, transforming, modeling the data. Towards the end, we hope that they uh, can support the decision making to Malaysia. All right. So we know that okay, there are uh, many types of data come and go. You can go to your, you can visit your handphone, all right? You can see here, all right, your handphone, okay? There are so many data, okay, types. Okay, for example, uh, the audio, the images, the video, the web, the links, the stream, and others. But we are looking at the data, which is, uh, more variety, visibility, and verbality means that we can pay attention for that data to do a uh, some classification, clarification, and we hope that the data that we get from the uh, active okay COVID nineteen or uh, death or recover COVID nineteen will give a successful prediction. Right. As a mathematician, nowadays people looking for a good job during the COVID-19. So, mathematician can be a data analyst or data scientist, okay, to support the decision making. So, let's we go the strictness, okay, of the statistical and mathematics background, all right, to support the decision. Okay, the first thing, there are so many ways to do. Okay, one of the important okay, or accurate prediction is based on the artificial intelligence. Okay, the data can be trained to be more intelligent and smart than human or maybe become uh, intelligent as a human or maybe comparative uh, intelligent as human. All right. So let's we find the uh, the technique that I'm going to focus here is uh, based on machine learning. Okay, not a machine, but the algorithm to produce okay the prediction model. All right, and then this is very important because the data is uh, divided into two set. One is for training, and the other one for testing. All right. So we can see from this graph the spectrum okay, of data science. Okay, from here you can see all right, artificial artificial intelligence is more high in terms of the okay, uh, business value, in terms of the good prediction, and more complexity. So never mind, okay, we can uh, learn because this is a good prospect for mathematician and statistical nowadays. I know you are quite familiar with the data analysis software that I propose here. For example, Excel, SPSS, SAS, R programming, all right, MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple, Pattern, and Tableau Public. All right, there are so many uh, ways to do the data analysis. But we are focused on the um, machine learning method or one of the artificial intelligence to um, do the Predictive model. All right. When we have a data, okay, there is two types of data. One is a supervised learning. The other one is an unsupervised learning. All right. So we are looking for the supervised learning because the data is uh, already uh, can be measured, can be labeled, and so on. All right. The supervised learning that I want to focus here is to do a classification. How we classify the data, okay, is considered as a COVID-19 and is considered uh, not a COVID-19, okay, and how the trend, the seasonal and then the residual, okay, when we do a forecast uh, of the COVID-19 data for next, okay, months, next two weeks, next a few, okay, a few uh, semester or terms, all right? So now, what we do, okay, when we have a, a limited data, okay, because in Malaysia, we start the problem of COVID-19 in February 2020. So, we do a data collection, increase the data collection, okay, we do the data preparation and start to do a modeling using the machine learning or AI, artificial intelligence, before we do the evaluation of 
data analyst. Data analyst, all right. So and then we do this uh, recycle based on the increasing data almost every day, okay, till today, all right. So now, what happened in our country when we have a data? Okay, we develop a model we call as a suspectable exposed infection and remove mathematical model. Okay, this model is based on the ordinary differential equation, ODE. All right, all right. So we 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 have a parameter okay of the active uh, data okay active uh, COVID nineteen patient. All right, and then we also can forecast the case okay from January to uh, June. Okay, 2021. All right. However, you can see here there is an error between the data and the prediction using the SERR mathematical model. So we can see this is a weaknesses when we model the data. Okay, when we know the initial condition and then boundary condition and others. Okay, so now how to correct this model? Right, so the issue is here how to correct this model. All right, the first is we want to use okay artificial intelligent methodology. All right, so now okay, we get the data from the coronavirus pandemic okay uh, malaysian profile from moh.gov.my. Okay, the data you can see here it is started from. Uh, January 2020 to July 2021. You can see the graph is increased in terms of the confirmed COVID-19, recovered COVID-19 and death because of the COVID-19. And then from there, we know that, okay, how to investigate the active COVID-19. Okay, you can see the purple color here. Also increasing, all right? So the total number of recovered is more than that. Okay, that's we want, okay? Uh, we don't want death, it's more than recover. So let's we have this data from April 2020 to June 2021. Okay, we apply um, okay, vision learning for this data. All right, so uh, when we go here, okay, the, the new cases, okay, new cases of COVID-19 um, pandemic, okay, virus is uh, increasing. You can see here, it's increasing, okay? So this is, a, we have a quite worry, maybe because of the vaccination program is not effective. Uh, we don't know because of the viral of the infodemic problem. We don't know. So let's we apply the machine learning for organizing okay, the uh, data that we get from the government. Right? So now, okay, to do that, okay, there is some uh, machine learning techniques. Okay, you always uh, quite familiar with the artificial neural network support vector machine. All right, extreme learning. Uh, this is a model or method. Okay, algorithm. Okay, that you use to do the um, training the data. All right. So in my case, I'm using okay a few methods. For example, okay, long short term memory network or LSTM. I'm also using Gaussian model as a classifier of the machine learning. All right, and then recurrent neural network. Okay, fine tree model. Okay, how we can see when we do the mathematical modeling. Okay, compared to the machine learning. Okay, the result is obviously different. All right, so the long short term memory LSTM network okay, can be divided into two types. The first is a univariate, and then the second is a multivariate. Okay, multivariate is depend on the okay, uh, not single. Okay, it's not single times a okay, dependent variable, but multi multi phase multi slot multi times okay multi interval of time all right so we can assert that okay lstm is a multivariate time series forecasting problem and is a one types of the recurrent neural network for learning process 
and this is considered as a sequence predictive problem. All right. So what is different between sequence and parallel? All right. So parallel is more on the big data. Okay, we deal with the uh, deep learning. Even though okay, LSTM support the deep learning, okay, which is uh, dealing with the terabyte, okay, pentabyte, your terabyte data. However, the problem is my country is uh, the data is limited. Started from uh, January, February 2020. Uh, so now we need to select which met method available, okay, to do the good predictive, all right, model. So now. In statistics, you're quite familiar with the ANOVA, SPSS, okay, regression, logic, okay, logistic regression, all right, time series, all right. But now we want to transform to the AI strategies we call as a neural network, all right, and then machine learning model with the optimization, all right? And uh, we try to compare with the statistical analysis that you are quite familiar. So in this case, okay, the predictive model that we want to focus, okay, is a classification model, okay? And then we call it as a classifier, okay? Uh, classifier um, technique, all right? We need to do the massive training database, Okay, uh, there is applying some learning to the different cases. In our case, okay, the different cases like, um, okay, how the data okay, recovered and then death and then active, okay, with the COVID-19. And then we put in the time frame with the time series, all right? So um, what inside in our mind now, we want to uh, solve the solution okay solve the question how the performance okay when we do the ai okay compared to the uh, traditional mathematical modeling so now okay let's i okay, start with the uh, correlation correlation is a uh, measurement okay for the data based on the time duration all right correlation represent the degree of the similarity all right, between a given time series, all right, and then the data, all right. So from here, you can see, okay, by using a spider LSTM, okay, I'm using open source. I'm not using, okay, programming, for example, MATLAB, Mathematica is a licensing. Most of my students stay at home, work from home. So we're looking for the open source software. One of them is a spider. You can also use Scilab, Python, and uh, others open source software, all right? So when we uh, okay, draw the graph for the LSTM auto coloration, all right, we can see there is a strong, okay, significant, strong coloration because the result, okay, is greater than value 0 0.02. So now, okay, for July 2021, we can predict, Okay, for the next time duration, what happened to this country? Is it increasing or decreasing? All right. So now, okay, uh, as a negative autocorrelation, okay, means that there is a positive misinformation. Misinformation here means that, okay, there is a uh, something problem, okay, in terms of the vaccination program, in terms of the pen, okay, uh, infodemic okay infodemic or uh, infodemic problem okay because most of the people start viral what type of the vaccine that they want to uh, use whether Sinovac, Estadica, Pfizer, okay Johnson and others okay they start looking all right so you can see here okay when we train the data okay there is no uh, over interpret okay no overfitting because the correlation is about 0 0.125, which is above of the 0 0.02. And this, uh, what is the implication? Okay, the predictive is um, accepted or um, uh, able to predict. Okay, the data is able to predict. Now, let's I uh, use one of the classifier, okay, model of the AI we call as a Gaussian. 
okay gaussian model or sometimes we call it as a gaussian processes classifier all right so um to do this okay uh, when i compare between malaysia and china okay china the data is like bell shape okay they are fulfill the gaussian model okay requirement okay there is so you can see here the actual the gaussian feed the confidence okay interval is really fixed to the data active COVID at mainland China. However, in my country, Malaysia, the data cannot fit in. So what should I do? All right, I need to partition. Okay, I need to partition the data. All right, so the indicator for performance measurement for detection, okay, we can investigate in few elements. For example, I'm using autocorrelation. Autocorrelation shows that okay, the data is significant to be trained to be test. The second is a forecast. Okay, I can see the seasonal trend and random. Okay. Uh, this one is based on the forecast element, okay, forecast component. All right, uh, seasonal means that we can see the pattern. Okay, we can see the trend of the data. Data market okay, pattern, validation loss, training loss, and then the error estimation, the residual between the data and the uh, predictive model that we develop. All right, so that will produce the, yes. Let's finish up in five minutes. All right, thank you. All right, so now, so let's we share with you the result. Okay, the result shows that we can use, okay, Gaussian model, but we need to partition the data into three types of the partitioning, okay, into three types of the distribution so that we can fulfill the Gaussian model, all right? The second is uh, we use, okay, um, um, LST, uh, TM, okay, the long term uh, time series here. All right, we can see here the variational in time series, okay, based on the short term cycle in the series is a uh, really fixed. Okay, the frequency is really okay, standard. All right, so the trend, okay, that we develop is uh, converged to the original data that we get from the government. All right, the residual is uh, can be observed. Okay, and you can see here it's increasing and decreasing. And the important is uh, the seasonal look. The pattern okay is a uh, is uh, in the static okay in the static manner. All right, we also say that okay the validation loss okay of data okay is a uh, decreasing. All right compared to the data training loss, all right? So it shows that the validation loss is greater than train loss. So meaning that, okay, we can train the data close to the um, actual, okay, data that we get from the government, okay? You can see the pattern here, okay? Uh, from the machine learning, from the classifier method, okay, the data is really close, okay, the prediction is really close to the exact solution, to the exact data. However, when we use the SDRR model, okay, you can see there is a residual, the error between the okay, approximation solution and the actual data. All right, the LSTM is much, much more predicted Okay, you can see the red color here. Okay, we can predict the data from um, July 2021 to August is increasing. Yes, it's happened to our country. The data increasing. But now in September, October and November, we hope the data decreasing. All right, because there's specific issues. All right, so you can see, okay, when I compare the actual data, okay, for the active cases in Malaysia and then the uh, predictive using the artificial intelligence, all right, you can see, okay, it's is much, much more converged, all right? So the result shows that, okay, the mathematical modeling that we use, for example, linear interpolation, regression, all right, and then tree, fine tree, okay, bring a very huge error, 
All right. So we believe that okay, uh, when we see the difference between the data and then the the uh, the, the the LSTM, okay, the graph is really converged. Okay, the graph is really converged compared to the other method, for example, linear regression. All right, and then the, um, the mathematical modeling, for example, Gaussian process, okay, classifier is very far. Right. So we hope that based on this data, we give awareness to the people of Malaysia to go for the vaccination because nowadays in our country is a number eight, okay, for of the Asian country to have the vaccination. So they can choose their three types, four types of vaccination, okay, which is uh, okay, uh, they are they are, they are willing, they can, they, are, they, are, they can they can select. Okay, they can select which type of the vaccination in our country. You can see in Malaysia now, they are still increasing. I think till October, okay, more than 90% people uh, done the vaccination. Okay, uh, I think more than more than 90% okay, for first vaccine. All right, for first vaccine. All right. So what we do, okay, now we hope that by increasing the data, we start Okay, using this ecosystem, this recycle, okay, collect the data, do data preparation, training the data, analyze the data, and retrain the model to get using the machine learning, using extreme learning, okay, we can enhance this model, okay, using the machine learning. Or if the data increasing, okay, we can get a good prediction using the deep learning, right? So, uh, till today, okay, most of the mathematics student and statistics student, they have uh, what we call okay, uh, very good career as a data analyst and data scientist because they are expert in doing modeling, doing algorithm, and they can cover okay, the knowledge of statistics. So, now let's we go to the conclusion. As a conclusion, okay, we believe that when we understand the big data with the 7V, variety, volume, the velocity, visibility, and others, we can get a good result. Okay, And then uh, COVID-19 in Malaysia is a uh, highly unpredicted okay, in last eight months because of the uh, infodemic problem, okay, maybe viral, okay, maybe the com uh, com complicated okay, to choose the types of vaccination and others. So we hope that that is not happened again based on the data shows that uh, okay, early uh, July 2021, okay, there is around 6,000 average okay, uh, okay, uh, with the uh, active COVID-19. So the model is not enough robust okay, when, because the data is only uh, 660, 560 days started from February okay, 2020. So we hope that we can uh, predict with a good ecosystem, good cycle of the machine learning process to forecast, okay, to predict, okay, to get a good prediction mode model all right so uh, keep in mind okay we need a data okay become more larger become more complex over time to uh, good so to have a good solution in terms of the performance evaluation in data analytics okay and then towards the end we hope that okay we can converge to the data that we have from the government okay so uh, from this data we can minimize the infodemic problem we can give a good awareness uh, in terms of the vaccination program all right and then uh we can keep a distance or keep a SOP, okay, to make sure uh, the active cases is uh, reducing, all right? So let's, I pass the session to Ms. Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Very insightful right. talk. So I'm, you can go uh, to the, my, my chat here. Yeah. I give you the link for the PowerPoint slides. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Norma. Thank you very much for a very insightful talk on predictions of data. Uh, we would like to hear more from you later in the Q&A sessions. Um, since we have a very tight schedule, I would like to remind us all that we will have the second Q&A session at the end of our presentations. So for those who have addressed questions to Dr. Norma, we will uh, patiently wait until the end. 
Joining us for our fourth session today is an amazing visionary. Uh, Jodzia Binti Atan is an associate professor at Faculty of Computer Science and Information Technology. She specializes in the area of software engineering and information systems, which are the core areas in computer design science. She graduated with Bachelor in Computer Science, Master's of Science, and obtained her PhD in Software Engineering from University Putra, Malaysia. She is appointed as Head of Laboratory for Laboratory of Halal Policy and Management, Halal Products Research Institute, University Putra, Malaysia, since September 2016 until recent. She is enthusiast in giving back enhanced and hybrid disciplines knowledge to future cohorts. She envisions to expand university's research output and talent from various fields of studies to contribute strategically in agriculture, technology, and halal industry as a new paradigm to bridge the university, the industry, and the government. Today, she will be talking about massive changes and expansion in halal industry worldwide, influenced by the global COVID-19 pandemic. Let's welcome Dr. Rodzia Binti Atan. We welcome Dr. Rodzia Binti Atan. Are you here already, uh, Professor? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doctor. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Thank you very much uh, to Madam Chairman uh, for the introduction. And then uh, thank you to Win Araniri, uh, especially to Fakulta Science and Technology for inviting and giving uh, opportunities to us uh, to involve in this uh, first ICOS uh, conference. Okay, so um, it is our pleasure, it is my pleasure to involve in this uh, event and congratulations to the organizers for being able to realize this conference despite the difficulties uh, that you may face uh, before. Okay, so uh, please allow me to share my screen uh, for my talk. Right, so... Okay, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, this is uh, this should be my title. Okay, so I'm going to uh, take 20 minutes of your time uh, to present uh, the title of uh, Information Systems and Digitalization in Halal Industry in Malaysia. So as we have been uh, introduced by Madam Chairman, Madam Moderator, so I am the Chairman Jatan. So my uh, my or not my core, my main uh, faculty will be uh, at faculty of uh, computer science and information technology. Uh, but at the moment, I'm holding this uh, administrative post as a uh, uh, laboratory, head of laboratory uh, for laboratory uh, policy and management, halal policy and management uh, at Institute, uh, at Halal Product Research Institute in Sikudra, Malaysia, which is also under UPM. Lah. Okay, so a little bit, just uh, one or two slides of uh, University of Putra, Malaysia. So this is uh, a university with uh, many disciplines. Okay, we have computer science, we have science, we have uh, veterinary, we have uh, agriculture and so on. So one of the largest uh, Malaysian uh, and premier university in Malaysia. And then, uh, so we have this uh, uh, with knowledge reserve. So I think that uh, uh, represented uh, by me. So I'm graduating from uh, UPM since my first degree. And then uh, now I'm serving to UPM <coughs> for almost 14 years now already. And then um, <coughs> uh, vision. Uh, of the University of Putra Malaysia is to become the, a university of international repute and uh, the mission is to make meaningful contribution to work well 
uh, creation, national building, uh, nation building, and uh, on universal human advancement through the exploration and dissemination of knowledge. Okay, so that is uh, uh, UPF uh, mission. Okay, so this is one of the views uh, from the campus. And then uh, this is another just like to share with you uh, for uh, exchange programs, uh, for summer programs. So before uh, pandemic, so we have many uh, many programs uh, that involve international, including Indonesia also. We, uh, I, I happen to have this one mobility program uh, organized uh, with uh, University in Negeri Malang. Okay, so all of you are welcome to university, either you are students or you are staff. So we may, should we have, we may have, uh, I hope and I pray that we can uh, live as how we did before, uh, where we can uh, go to one country to another and share experience uh, face to face and physically, inshallah. <clears throat> All right, so then moving on. Uh, the agenda for today, for my talk, will be, uh, this is the content, okay, so because I'm going to talk about uh, halal industry, uh, the digitalization, uh, information systems analysis and benefit and opportunities uh, that we can get uh, from this, uh, uh, I might say what I might say, uh, innovation. Because we are living in these uh, difficult times, so what we can do as what the, the previous uh, keynote speakers uh, mentioned, um, even though we are working from home and things like that, but uh, we still have something that we can work to fulfill our objectives uh, for work or for study. Okay? <clears throat> Okay, all right. So let's look at um, what is um, industry, yeah, halal industry, lah. Okay, uh, per se. So from one era to another era. So basically, um, 2020, 2021, so we can be say that, uh, we, we can say that we are in a pandemic era. So those two years or three years, uh, we face many difficulties. We have to change our norms, our normal, uh, no, our normal norms, our norms before to the new norms. Okay, so, but the thing is that <clears throat> if we are looking uh, at things positively, so inshallah, we can, we can have a positive output from the situation. So, uh, a little bit of uh, changes that we need to face uh, during this era. So, we can see that any companies that survives from uh, pre-pandemic to current and post-pandemic has almost certainly survived numerous drastic changes. Okay, so if you have a company or a university that stands uh, or industry that stands from uh, 1960s, until 2020s and until current. So means that they have gone to several phases of uh, changes in uh, era. Okay, so uh, very quick examples, very uh, obvious examples such, such as the CE's company. Okay, so nowadays uh, the, the pre-era uh, will be the taxi, but for the current and post, uh, we have to deal, the, the companies have to deal with right hailing or inhaling companies such as Gojek, Uber, uh, Grab, uh, Lyft. Okay, so, and then uh, all these companies, they do not use uh, manpower anymore. They just use uh, simple mobile applications. Uh, they just link up the customer to the service and then to service to the customer and to the payment gateway. Okay, so that is the, the changes from the normal. Okay, we have to stop taxi and then we enter the taxi and then we pay the, the driver, the taxi driver, the, the fees and then we enter. But nowadays, it's, there's no more transaction uh, of such. 
okay, except for the, the physical uh, well-being uh, inside the inside the, the transportation uh, okay and so as uh, goes to the uh, Airbnb homestays online staycation even the, the new uh, what called uh, the new terminology of staycation uh, has, has also been uh, introduced. Okay, so uh, this uh, has shaken up the hospitality industry. Okay, so it means that hospitality, the hotels, the resorts, okay, so they have to keep up uh, to the pace where the previous era and the current era is not the same anymore. And then uh, same goes to online retail. So we have gig economy. So gig economy, there's no more uh, human being involved in transactions. Okay, so major shopping platforms. Okay, you can shop anything at any means at any time using the, the, the shopping platforms like Shopee, Lazada, or why, why, why not? <clears throat> okay, so uh, these are all the new ways of doing business so therefore industries uh, that need that wants that want to to, to maintain and to this uh, different era they need to tag along or they need to go along with the, uh, with the changes okay so despite the pandemic promotion the FMB uh, food and beverages segment of industry is growing at least data from Malaysia and Indonesia for quarter three for the quarter 2021. Okay, so FMP, it never goes down, right? Uh, in transaction due to contract demand, uh, expanded players. So now this is uh, very easy uh, to, uh, people will uh, order food uh, through apps or through online and then uh, these uh, what are food makers, uh, they are going to cook and prepare the food and send it uh, using the grab uh, food or food bundles or whatever uh, delivery system. Okay, and uh, that is for food preparation, but extended from food preparation, so we have the industry. Uh, that maintain the, the raw materials of this food, such as uh, rice, uh, oil, uh, wheat, and uh, and some some other uh, some other things. So these are all been expanded also. So suddenly the request, the demand for wheat is booming. Why? Because the cake industry is expanding. Okay, suddenly uh, the, the increase of uh, meat is, uh, the demand of meat is increasing. Why? Because there's uh, well, the, the preparation, people, uh, there are so many people who are ordering uh, meat for their food and so on. So that is why FMB is, uh, is not taking off from the, uh, from the uh, changes of the era, lah. Okay, especially for the pandemic promotion. Okay. And halal industry, so this is very uh, closely tied up. Halal industry and uh, food and beverages. So actually halal consists of many other things like cosmetics, uh, FMB, uh, packaging, uh, transportation and so on. But in, the, in this speech, so I will only uh, touch base on FMB uh, and halal Okay, because it's much more uh, closer to us and uh, it's easier for us to understand. Okay, so dealing with current economic era, there are a few factors that keep up. And uh, uh, see, and to shake up uh, with the demand increase, such as the use of technology in food. Okay, so the knowledge about categories of consumer, and uh, also the nutritional value, sustainability, innovation, and packaging. Okay, so this is when uh, the, all the data can be uh, analyzed in order for this uh, industry player or the businesses to understand more of their uh, customer or consumer. 
So for uh, categories of consumers, some are vegetarian, vegan, halal. Okay, some are very uh, particular about the nutritional value, and then some are particular about the sustainability of food waste. Okay, so and certain innovation and also uh, to the packaging of the uh, of the uh, FMB products. Okay, so this all goes uh, to data collection, information system, information analysis, and knowledge gathering. Okay, so with information, so this uh, all, uh, the, the, the whole thing can be uh, can be better managed, right? So that is why uh, information systems and information analysis is very important, and that is also why we are here. Uh, we are addressing the halal digitalization activities. Okay, so this is information systems. Okay, so what is information system? It cannot run away from these three main factors. Okay, the first one is people. So information system is, uh, people is vital or important for information system because it is to help support decision making. Coordination, control, analysis, and visualization of an organization. Okay, so these are the three pillars or the three points uh, that needs to work together. Okay, so we have people, we have the customer, we have the businessman, we have the uh, importer, exporters, and so on. So these are the people. So the next one is uh, process. So what is process? Process, especially in digitalization. Uh, is uh, the, 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 the ones that we are regularly doing currently, uh, scanning your uh, QR code at the uh, in front of shops, uh, scanning to, to uh, your digital uh, vaccination. So these are all the data collection processes, uh, data analysis, the, the information gathering and so on. So these are the process in information systems. And the third one is technology. Technology are such as the, the mobile devices, uh, the IoT, uh, BYOD, bring your own devices, and uh, even this uh, microphone and uh, earbuds and so on. So these are the technologies that is also important for uh, information systems. Okay, so with all these uh, important points, the people, the process, uh, and then the technology, so we can have it uh, divided into several components. So these components are such as the hardware and the software, the technology related for this information system, the data, the people, uh, these are the rules. Okay, that what uh, that we can use in order to, to come up with our information system analysis and uh, the last one will be the process. Okay, process will be in terms of how uh, how do we want to go about in terms of analyzing the, the data and to whom that it needs to be uh, sent off to. Okay, who will be benefiting from the uh, information system. Okay, so uh, for the technology, the hardware is the physical component. The software will be the instruction, the, the programs. Okay, for computer science students, so normally they will do uh, programming and so on. So inside uh, is another application software or the operating systems uh, that is uh, enabling the, the, the software or the programs to be uh, operative. And then we have the data. Data is the collection of facts or information. And then uh, especially nowadays, it's very important for us to have connection with the networks uh, to allow the transmission and data sharing. Okay, so people, what is people? People also known as user, person who use and operates the computer or other machines. Okay, so all levels of organization can be uh, the outside partners such as suppliers. Okay, so this is about information systems first. Okay, and our process with a series of steps uh, to achieve a desired outcome. 
So the benefits of information system process will be uh, to increase productivity, to better decision making ability, to improve uh, processes using available data uh, within the company or externally, and continuous improvement uh, using technology and competitive advantages. Okay, so now uh, we finished about uh, information uh, systems. Okay. Before we enter or before we proceed to uh, halal digitalization, the need for halal digitalization, uh, so we need to understand what is the current uh, stand for halal digitalization. Okay, so it's actually um, before, before the pandemic era. So we normally go by these uh, manual activities. Okay, so manual activities are such as manual data input, uh, manual process, and uh, normally it is paper based. Okay, as compared to uh, when we have the digitalization in place, so we are going to change all this, all this process. Okay, so manual data input uh, process is cumbersome. Okay, we always need to use a uh, human being to enter the data. It's time consuming, so one by one. Uh, and then uh, the, what about the, the, the uh, human interference or human um, involvement in data, inputting data into the, the, into the system, uh, will be jeopardizing the integrity okay, uh, of halal and qualified. Okay, so, so this is uh, as what we uh, stated in uh, Al Quran and Hadith. Okay, so next is uh, shitty task, uh, consumers perception. Okay, normally, um, in especially in halal, uh, consumers uh, the, the 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 trust. Okay, the trust and then the acceptance of uh, certain halal status. Um, especially when it is uh, with human intervention uh, is some, sometimes making uh, the consumers uh, trust uh, shaking. Means that, uh, that they do not have a full trust on the, uh, on the products, especially in terms of uh, the, the halalness of it. Okay, so shaky consumers perception, trust and confidence toward products, quality, spiritually and ethically. Right, so there are many uh, many points of uh on this trust that they can that they can uh, put in uh if it is involved manual activities. Okay, and then next it always uh, use human intervention. Okay, so human intervention uh sometimes uh erroneous. Sometimes human intervention is uh, uh, late. Okay, uh, we we enter our application today, but the response uh, is only going to be sent to back to us like few more days after. Okay, so that is human intervention. So that is why we need for halal digitalization in order to synergize. And in order to make it multi-dimensional, so the steady development of globalization uh, 4.0 sparks uh, the need to synergize human beings and machines. Okay, so that's that's why uh, nowadays uh, many of the information being input in the system using devices. So the human perspective to problem solving is multi-dimensional and is more apt for decision. Okay, but uh, synergizing human and machine, so human is, we still need human, yeah? it doesn't mean that human intervention is uh, going to be uh, omit uh, 100%, no, uh, but human perspective uh, will be based uh, on the more to the problem solving. And then the advantage Dr. Razia? I'm very sorry to inform you that your time um, is only five minutes left, so uh, maybe you can finish up in five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
better alright so the advantages will be in terms of monitoring in terms of uh, integrity in terms of quality for this digitalization uh, called uh, initiative so in order to enhance the data resource management data driven uh, customer experience and so on so there are so many advantages if we can uh, do uh, digitalization and information system analysis on two things that is uh, uh, important, uh, especially to our daily activities. So the objective will be in terms of quality assurance, in terms of uh, certificate authentication. Okay, so it's going to be secure, consistent, uh, verified, validated, trusted, and so on. And in terms of Sharia compliance. Okay, so because uh, there's nothing that we can change uh, if it is uh, mentioned by the, by the uh, Sharia, right? So it's uh, abiding to the, to the uh, rules and regulation of religions, Islamic religion. But anyhow, there are challenges uh, to digitalization uh, activities. So among others, there's uh, only a few of it. Uh, so among others will be in terms of data sharing. So some people, they do not want to share data. So therefore, uh, in terms of uh, information system analysis, is going to be uh, hindered a bit. And then uh, fragmented system, okay, siloed operation. Okay, some of the operations uh, need to be done, uh, uh, not need to be done, are done, normally done in silos. So they don't have this uh, interconnection between uh, processes and synchronized data visualization and different data format, right? So digitalization of data. But however, there are many approaches. So I'm showing to you these uh, two examples of uh, research frameworks and uh, information system model that been uh, developed by uh, students uh, for their research. Okay, so data analysis using metadata. So we can use metadata in terms of uh, analyzing this uh, uh, data or information uh, accordingly to metadata instance. Means that we don't have to, to have a specific data, but we can just go to the metadata uh, level only. And then another one is uh, data analysis using service level agreement. So this is also uh, another example of information system analysis model uh, that been developed. Okay, so halal food information, so in acquiring the knowledge. So we normally as a Muslim or Muslim, uh, people who look for uh, uh, halal uh, products, so in terms of digitalization, we need to define the products, determine the, 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 for the requirements of the customer of the product and create the concepts of halal. And then uh, we can build business case on top of that to carry out the market assessment opportunity and then uh, product cost estimation and also risk assessment. So in conclusion, uh, information system is becoming more vital in the halal industry. So many applications and system uh, can be produced uh, to manage existing issues. And then standardization of halal system approaches is necessary. So with that, I thank you, Madam Moderator. Thank you.
Oke, okay, uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good uh, afternoon. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be very honored. Uh, actually, Aceh has a very uh, strong uh, uh, history yeah? <laughs> with me. I've been, uh, I've been visiting the countries. Uh, I mean, I've been visiting the, 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 the states for since 2016. Yeah? I think two, three times. And, and it's been a very uh, enjoyable visit to, to that area. That's why I'm, I'm very sad that the, that the uh, talk should be, li uh, should be conducted online. <laughs> it should be conducted face-to-face -face so that we can have more uh, discussions. And then we can have, we, uh, I mean, the other speakers also can enjoy uh, Aceh as a very good place uh, to, to visit. Yeah? So today, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the role of MOS. Yeah? Uh, from different perspectives. Yeah? I'm going to present a different perspective of MOS uh, and with some, some experiments, yeah? some experiments that we are doing uh, during the pandemic time. Yeah? Okay. Uh, there's, there is a notification in my screen. <laughs> Keep appearing. Yeah? Okay. Uh, the message that I will, I will start, uh, that I would like to deliver today is uh, I will start the discussion with the introductions. Yeah? Actually, in, our, in one of our books, uh, most uh, spiritual hub for community development, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Muhammad Tajuddin, yeah, one of the uh, profound uh, uh, experts in the Islamic architectures, was, was giving an introduction. Yeah. In his introduction, he was saying that uh, for architects, when they, when they are requesting to, requested to design a mosque, yeah, there are two options that they, they normally did. Yeah. Number one is that they all, normally they go with the client's uh, 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 needs, yeah? <laughs> the requirement of the clients, which is, uh, as we can see, they use the domes, minarets, mukarnas. I am going to show you some, some pictures of that after this. And also, or uh, the architect can choose a modern uh, uh, language of MOS, yeah? uh, which is uh, more modern in the sense that uh, it goes with the naturals, uh, materials, etc. Uh, I'm going to show you many pictures. I have a very long, so, uh, lots of slides to share. Uh, so hopefully going to be very fast. Now. Okay, so uh, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, a mosque in the different uh, views. Yeah? When people talk about Islamic architectures, especially on the design of mosques, uh, uh, we talk about uh, Islam, uh, which is... Uh, Sometimes it's, it's, it's a wasteful, wasteful, ethnocentric, uh, it's very Arab, etc. So I'm going to, to talk about that in more details today. Okay, next. So this is a, a, a popular uh, image when people talk about Islamic architecture, especially on the design of the mosque. Okay, next. 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 I, I would like to ask a question. So how about this? kind of buildings <laughs> is a, a very unique building so when i did my masters a long time ago uh, i was uh, uh, questioning the idea of the mosque yeah? because in here okay go next next in this in this buildings uh, can you go back what's a little bit okay in this kind of building as you can see uh uh main mate yeah? Uh, the, which I'm going to discuss later in the details. Main mate was was somehow was was uh, embellished by the natural mate. <laughs> this is a design by Frank Lloyd Wright, yeah? one of the uh, founding fathers of the American architectures. Yeah? When he designed the buildings, he was believed that the god, yeah? the gods, or the or the upper, uh, the the god is the only body of god that you will ever see. That's why, in order for us to understand God. We must understand, we can see there in the nature. <laughs> they say in his design, he was putting the building very down to earth so that the nature things can embellish, the, the, can, can grow up, can, can show up so that uh, it can show uh, a God's creature yeah, in, this, in this world. Okay, next. When I become, uh, can you go back a little bit? Back in 2019, I was becoming a, a keynote for for uh, um, a seminar in MOS in, in USM yeah? uh, 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 three years ago, uh, two years ago, sorry. Uh, on that uh, uh, conference, I was highlighting the, the, the issue saying that actually there's a misgap between our traditional architectures 
which is as you can see at the left side. And our traditional architecture in Malaysia, yeah, you can see there's a, there's a missing links in between between them. So it seems like there's a something uh, going on which make from that particular traditional architectures into a so-called modern and postmodern language in architectures. Okay, next. This is a prophet mosque in reconstruction by Hassan Udin Khan in his books. Yeah? Uh, there's a big difference. Can you go next? If you're looking at the previous mosque, yeah, which is reconstruction of the buildings, and the, the other one, which is the reconstruction of the buildings and its activities. Yeah? As you can see at the, at the seconds, uh, uh, if you talk about the, the original of mosque, <laughs> the most original mosque, uh, this is the reconstruction of it. Yeah? You can see there. There's a three component of mosque, which is uh, somehow is missing in the current uh, modern mosque. Yeah? Number one, they call it Zula. Zula is the place when people are doing prayers. If you're looking at the, at the, at the uh, buildings, you see at the upper part. Yeah? Or in, in architecture, we use the north part. <laughs> the north part is normally at the upper part. It was covered by, by the kurma, yeah? by the apa, kurma leaves there. Yeah? Uh, so, so the dead leaves there. So uh, people are praying in that area. Yeah? At the second one, it's in the open area. They call it a courtyard, yeah, in the open area, where people are doing lots of activities. While well, the other one is at the, at, at the, at the down there. Yeah, there's down there. There's a comfort area. They call it a sufa. Sufa is a place for, 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 for the uh, companion of prophets to, to learn, yeah, to learn directly from the prophets. Yeah, they, they're staying there. Yeah. So in, the, in our traditional mosque, normally when we receive a, 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 a big, land of for, for the design of mosque we covered everything yeah in in one 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 single roof and we forgot that actually the mosque actually have three different functions yeah number one is the praying areas which is the the, the zula areas the courtyard areas and also the sufa actually uh, sometimes we call it a place maybe for for musafir yeah? for people traveling people who want to learn about islam yeah? they can stay there to, 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 to learn about uh, Islam uh, firsthand in the mosque environment. Okay, next. So when the mosque go into different areas, Islam is a very tolerant uh, religious. Yeah? <laughs> it's very tolerant religion. So when it goes to different areas, it, it adapt the local cultures and local language. So it, that's why you see the mosque have a different forms. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, you say in, in, in the world, based on other Khan books, there are six types of book, uh, six types of typologies. One, they call it as a, as a hypostyle, uh, Turkish, Iranian, Indian, and also, uh, Chinese, and also Southeast Asia. So these are typologies that, that people are using. But if you want to know the original of the mosque, that was the first one, <laughs> not this one. Okay, next. So it goes into different areas of the world, yeah, as you can see there, uh, in, 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 in uh, Middle East, in Africa, in Turkey, in other areas. Okay, next. This is a, a modern mosque. Yeah? If you see a modern mosque, as I mentioned before, uh, if an architect follows its rules, yeah, it, normally they will go for, for modernistic and, and, and abstract forms. Yeah? Uh, if, you, if they go to the clients or the popular understanding, they will go for the, uh, for the uh, Middle East uh, forms yeah? or, the, or the one that people normally see it before. Okay, next. Yeah. When we talk about uh, the image of mosque, yeah, uh, they are actually there are four issues. Yeah? I, I don't have a time to explain each of them. Yeah, but I'm going to give you samples. Yeah? I will show you pictures. Thanks to my to my fellow friends of uh, Doctor Ismail Slagadir, uh, he was giving giving some pictures. Yeah, from the Egypt. Okay, next. Uh, at the left side is actually Rabbi Ibrahim bin Ezra, which is which is a uh, 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 rabbi in, in Egypt. Yeah? In 19th century uh, revolutions, yeah? uh, on the left, on the right side, it, there are two people sitting there. <laughs> Number one is an imam; the other one was a priest. Yeah? So, if if you can imagine, if Ibrahim bin Ezra coming to Malaysia or coming to Indonesia, I believe he will become an imam <laughs> in our mosque yeah? because the the appearance, the appearance that he is wearing. Same thing on the left side; we cannot differentiate which one is actually an imam. Which one is actually uh, a priest because the context was an Egypt. Okay, next. Next, please. Yeah, this is a sample of the Coptic Bibles. Yeah. Uh, 
with the Mamluk Quran and Coptic Bible. You see the ornamentations. Eh? The ornamentations are uh, it's similar. Okay, next. Same thing when we that was not <laughs> nothing to do with architecture. So if you see the architectures in terms of the ornaments, yeah. Next. Next. Okay. So I, I, I know that this these issues actually is a very controversial issues in, in, in Malaysia, <laughs> in Indonesia also. But but uh, that was the, 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 the situation in the countries, yeah, in the particular country in Egypt, when they talk about ornamentations. Yeah, as I mentioned before, if you're referring to original form of a mosque, actually that is the original form of the mosque. Lah. Okay, next. So uh, we did some experiments uh, regarding the design of the mosque. Yeah. So we, we give them a, a different perspective on how actually we can design the mosque. Yeah. Rather than talk about the form, which is the whether you want to use a dome, you want to use minarets, we change it into values. Values mean what are the values that are required in the mosque yeah, uh, in, to represent an Islamic architecture. Yeah. So we talk about values. There are, there are four values that we're presenting to our students. I was showing you the, the design after that. Uh, reminder of God, remember, reminder of uh, uh, Ibadah and Perjuangan. Today I'm going to present you like uh, four of them. Yeah. Okay, next. Reminder of God. If you can see in the Quran, yeah, if you're reading the Quran, if you're reading uh, the, what the prophets was teaching to us, actually God was trying to get us to, to observe, yeah, like the previous, uh, uh, the first presenter was saying, uh, Dr. Huda's presenting, yeah, uh, we, they are, he, were, he was asking us to look at how actually the, 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 the nature was created. <laughs> looking how the, the mountains, looking how the camels was created, looking how the fruits, looking at other, other God created there. So, next. As, as you can see in this, in this, in this uh, surah, eh? and he who, who spread out the earth, mountain standing firms, uh, flowing rivers, fruits. Yeah. So, as you can see there, the, the main objective of the, of the uh, built environment is actually to get us to get to know God through nature. That was the, the, the message there. Okay, next. Okay. So, in order for us to, 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 to design our mosque, yeah. We, we, we should show somehow, we, can, we have to show that this is how we as a human learn how to understand God through God's creatures. Yeah, they are the aspects that we are talking about reminders of ibadah and perjuangan. If you can see that uh, in, the, in, the, in the Quran, the, 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 the surah on, on salat always followed by the zakat. So when you talk about ibadah, Actually, in Islam, it has a different perception with other religions. Yeah? Other religion, sorry. Other religion. In other religion, you might separate between the ibadah and also the daily life. But in Islam, it's all together. Yeah, that's why you go next. Okay. So, if you see that, next. So, if you see Islam, we as a Muslim, is not requested just to do prayers, uh, fasting, but we also need to mix. Yeah? We need to help the community, join with the people. Yeah? So we have to become a part of the communities. That was the message. <laughs> Next. So house of worship or community should be a community center. <laughs> so that's why if you see in the previous pictures of mosques during the prophet's times, as you can see there, it's very clear. That the mosque is not only a uh, place as a prayer's place uh, only. <laughs> it's only. It's not only a house of God only. It's actually praying as a community center to develop the communities. Okay? They should not make like a monument. Yeah? Like you, next. If you can, the next slide, yeah? how we design the, 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 uh, the gates, the fans. Yeah? One of very good sample was Masjid Negara. Masjid Negara was a very good sample which was designed yeah, previously to cater for, for, for uh, Musafir. Yeah, if they are actually, that's why it's in, in front of the uh, railway stations. Yeah. When people have uh, uh, traveling, they need place to, to rest. They, will, they can always pray at Masjid Negara and they can have rest there.
So that was the, the ideas of mosques as a community uh, centers to cater the community needs during that time. Okay, next. Reminder of life hereafter. <laughs> this is one of the aspects. Yeah? Uh, last time I, I received one project, yeah? one, one project from in Makassar. Yeah? Uh, one of my friends is actually developing uh, the whole areas in Makassar. And he was sending the drafts of the design to me. And then my, my question is that, where, where you put the cemeteries? <laughs> he, was, he was shocked and surprised. <laughs> why, why, why do you need cemeteries? No, the cemetery is a very important element in the Islamic city planning. Uh, because by looking at cemeteries, you are, people are reminded to death. <laughs> so they are, they are closer to the gods because of that. Yeah? So, so it's very important to show that in your uh, city planning yeah. design. Okay, next. Next, yeah. I'm showing you some, some of the uh, hadith related with that, where the summit, where the funeral, yeah, when, when, uh, when, when, when funeral procession is going, come, coming up on the, on the prophets, in front of the prophet, prophet will stand up. Yeah. It shows that we have to respect the, 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 the funeral procession. Yeah. Uh, people are stand, stood up, uh, even, even uh, during that time when the person was not a Muslim, he, said he was a Jew, Prophet still still stand up instead of respecting that particular uh, apa, uh, apa, jenazah. Eh? That he is still respecting that particular jenazah because of that. Okay, next. Humilities, yeah? as I mentioned before. Yeah? Uh, there's a very interesting hadith on that. Next. Yeah? Prophet unidentified at the gathering. Yeah? So one day, Prophet was sitting among his companion. Suddenly somebody is coming. He was asking them, who amongst you is Muhammad? <laughs> so it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, general hadith. Yeah? Uh, but as an architect, I'm looking at a very different way. Yeah? Uh, so it means that the prophet during that time is not sitting in, front, in, 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 the upper, in the special chair. He's not wearing a crown. He's not wearing a, a, a clothes different with others. So if you... If you Translating into architectural language, when we are designing a building, the building should not be stands. Yeah. <laughs> it might be, uh, can be identified as a mosque, but it shouldn't be stand, stands, egos. <laughs> With egos uh, uh, standing alone and, 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 and trying to track people yeah, because of that. So it is it's a whole translation of uh, a general hadith into a, a design and architecture. Okay, next. Yeah. Prophet's room, as you can see, how, how humble actually the prophets live in his room. Yeah. Next. Yeah, monumentalities. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So, when we talk about mosques from value perspective, yeah, from the value perspective, uh, there are different ideas. <laughs> uh, previously, we are talking about mosques from the object discuss, discourse. When you talk about object discourse, we discuss about the forms, whether it should have a dome, it should have uh, minerals, it should have other things. So we, we change it. <laughs> when we change into values, then we have different different ideas. Yeah? Broke, um, broken up mass. Uh, I'm going to show you the samples after this. Okay, next. Yeah. Okay. Before that, uh, let's go back to the to the to the previous sketches, yeah? previous, previous drawing. Yeah? If you look at this previous drawing, this is one of my students redraw it in his thesis, in his uh, master thesis. He was redraw it and he discussed about it. One thing very interesting on the mosque is that uh, beside the building, when architecture, most of the architects will talk about the building of a mosque. Actually, there is another aspect which is very important on the mosque, which is its institution. <laughs> mosque is actually is not only about buildings. It's, all, it's, on, it's also about institution, how you manage it. Yeah, so, so that's why when, 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 when people was, was, was uh, asking me uh, uh, how to design a mosque, I say, okay, you separate for the management fee, for the management cost, and also for the building cost. I mean, management means we, we don't want the mosque after you build up a very, uh, you spend a very, lots of money building, building a very expensive mosque, then you don't have any more money. Then you have to ask for, for, apa, for zakat, yeah, for zakat, for zakat, for the people, so that, so that you can build more about mosques. Yeah, so mosques should be a, a community development center. 
So they are the one who supposed to manage the money to help the communities, <laughs> not the community who support the mosque. <laughs> so that's how it, it goes. So there's a thing called institutions. Yeah? Okay, can you go next? So <laughs> Next, next. Ah, so this is summaries of it. Yeah. He talk about the the program of the mosque. Okay, next. Yeah, so this is the the bubble diagram of that. So this is some sample of the students. Yeah, when they hear our discourse, a mosque from the value center discourse. Yeah, it 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 become like this. Okay, next. Just showing. Just flip the picture. Next. 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 Uh, this is one sample of Masjid Mesra Wanita. Eh? <laughs> Masjid Mesra Wanita means masjid which was designed to serve a women's needs. Uh, so they say there you will find a swimming pool for women, a spa, you will find a lot of childcare centers, a lot of spaces which require by women. Yeah. Okay. Next. Because we can discuss more detail on that. Next, okay, there, there was a spaces. Next, I'll give you the, the, the you can get the copies after this, you can have the detail of that. Next, next, this is a sample of masjid for hip hop. <laughs> they call it hip hop mosque, actually, a mosque for youngsters. Yeah, the design for youngsters. So you say it's a different design and different ambience there. Okay, next. 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 This is our projects. Yeah? We have a uh, free mosque design projects. Can you go just flip through the, the pictures? Next. Next. This is our prototype. Last time for after the Aceh earthquakes, yeah? we developed the prototype. Next. 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 So. Uh, Ikatan Arkitek Indonesia Aceh is actually identifying the, the, the mosque which actually they demolished in the time. Yeah. We can discuss further on these prototypes. Yeah. Don't have any wall, have a, have a water flowing, don't have mineral, don't have any dome. So this is another sample. Yeah. Next. Uh, Pondok Quran in Bekasi, Indonesia. Part of our free mosque design. Okay, they, I'm going to show you to wrap up the thing. Our two projects that we were kings. Yeah. Number one is our Akopon experiment. If you remember in our previous uh, typologies, we put uh, waters, yeah? uh, waters as a part of uh, cooling elements of the, of the moss. Yeah? So this is our experiments. Lah. It's not yet uh, being uh, uh, built in the, in the proper research on that, but actually we play on that. Next, yeah? self production. Yeah? If you might, some of you might know aquaponics. Yeah? When we grow up a fish at the same time, the plants to go there. Yeah? This is some issues related with that. Next. Next, next, yeah. halal issues, another issues. Yeah. This is a so so. I'm doing an experiment on that. Doing the PKP, <laughs> doing the the pandemic times. I build up a, a, a pond. A build up. A, a, I mean, uh, we experiment on that. Next, next, next. Yeah, oh, it's good. I mean, we within one year we produce kanko, we produce uh, tomatoes. Next. Yeah. Uh, salads, <laughs> fish, <laughs> definitely. Next, jagung, yeah, uh, apple, corns, uh, bayam, chilies. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, this is as a proposal yeah, for the one one uh, toughest in in people. Actually, we're working. Hopefully, after the pandemic, we can work on that. This is a proposal that we working uh, types of it. Okay, next, next, next. Okay, next. Next. Okay, last but not least, uh, this is our second project. Uh, we are uh, uh, designing a mosque for uh, Musi Hoven. Yeah? 
masyarakat Indonesia, Muslim Indonesia in Eindhoven, in Holland. Yeah? Actually, it's, it's a one, uh, two stories house which was modified into a, a mosque and cultural centers. Yeah? This is the, the scheme. Yeah? I think we, we're working in the subjects in my university for community engagement. So that particular subject, uh, we div divide the students. So they come up with the designs. Lah. So we last time we, we finalized with eight specific designs. So this is done uh, during the pandemic time. So definitely no site visit, all doing all done online. <laughs> it's not common for architectures, but uh, you have to do it because of the pandemic. So, so Alhamdulillah, we finished that. Uh, now we are working for the next year. So hopefully we can start. We got, got two more cities. One is Utrecht. The other was Vienna so in Austria. <laughs> We're working on that particular uh, mosque and cultural centers. Okay. Now back, just uh, finish up the presentations. Uh, what is an Islamic architecture? So we, when we go back to the questions, yeah. uh, can you go back a little bit? Just three more slides. Is it a reminder of man? Yeah, when you talk about mosque, you, you design a buildings first, then you turn down all the environment, then you landscape the, 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 the plant. <laughs> or it's a reminder of God. When you building, actually have to humbly uh, submissive to the natures. Yeah? So they, they should be embedded to the nature. There's a two different approach in design. Okay, next. Is it, is it uh, individuals or is it a humility? Uh, that was the question. Next. Okay. So when we summarize uh, a mosque on Islamic architecture design, I'm, I'm concerned about this. I summarize it into these three uh, uh, statements. Like one is the Quranic verse on the Arat, as I mentioned before, how the nature is actually uh, can be shown, can be seen in the, in the environment, in the context. Humility, yeah? when our building is, a, is, a, is a humble in the context, it's not uh, trying to expose himself yeah? too much on the environment, show off, yeah? not show off. Or community interactions, when actually the, the mosque or the building in Islamic context should be as a, as a hub for interaction for the communities. Okay? I think that's all for me. Next. Uh, thank you very much for the times and the opportunities. Uh, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Nankula. Very interesting, giving us new insights how to perceive a mosque in a different view. Um, we will move on to our last session for question and answers. So I will open up a number of questions, but uh, before that, are there any uh, anyone in the room who would like to ask questions directly to Dr. Norma Elias or Dr. Razia Binti Atan or Dr. Nankula? Once again, you can click the raise hand icon on your screen so that we can spot you easier. I do have a question here, uh, one for Professor Norma from uh, Raihana. The question is, I would like to ask uh, about how is the relationship between machine learning and artificial intelligence? And one more, as I know about programming language for machine learning is Python, and I want to know, is there any other programming language? To Dr. Norma, maybe um, you can answer the question from Raihana. Uh, this question has been answered by Dr. Norma herself in the chat box, but maybe Dr. Norma, you can share uh, the answer dire directly to all of us here. So you can see here, okay, the deep learning. Deep learning is success, is a inside the machine learning because deep learning using a big data. Machine learning using a small data. Okay, big data, for example, okay, terabyte, yota byte, all right? So this is considered big data. A small data, for example, gigabyte, okay, kilobyte, okay? And then uh, artificial intelligence is a, a strategy to analyze the data. So, okay, most of the mathematician working as a data scientist and data analyst, which is, okay, need the skill from the artificial intelligence, mathematics background, because you are need to develop the algorithm and statistics, because statistics, okay, we need to do the forecasting. So, I already, I okay, send uh, some information through the link at the chat box, right?
Um, I personally myself have a, have a question to um, Dr. Nankula. Uh, if we, you mentioned um, a missing gap or links in designs of our mosque uh, today. If uh, we see the trend of mosque today in Aceh, it is actually surrounded by uh, community activities. We have uh, TPA, what we call pengajian. We have people learning in mosques, not only praying. And in Aceh, most mosques are built surrounded by uh, a complex, usually known as in Aceh as the Islamic center of an area. So we can see the design of a mosque as a sort of compound. But what raises my question today is how we can actually educate the society or the community on the importance of that institution of a mosque, as most mosques are built um, by the village, and most, uh, mostly focusing on budget, on minarets, domes, and so on. So um, what approach can we take based on your experience as, a, uh, as an academician and as a practitioner and, and on how to prioritize on concepting uh, a mosque as an institution? Okay, I, I think uh, I would like to, to, I think this question was related with the domes uh, questions after that. I, I, I try to address the questions uh, as, as, as brief as possible. Uh, what I'm trying to, to send the message in the presentation is that we have to change our mindset from the object-centered discourse into a value-centered, which is very important. <laughs> because of what? I've been, I've been uh, presenting or researching uh, Islamic architecture since 2002. <laughs> I think some of you might not be entering uh, universities during that time. Yeah. Uh, so since 2002, I always receive the same question. How about the usage of domes, or minerals? Uh, you can see in, in other uh, countries, they always use dome and minerals. So it's not about uh, usage of dome or minerals. It's, bet it's about how we actually change our mindsets in designing the whole mosque. <laughs> so if you talk about objects, objects means uh, forms. Yeah, they, 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 whether you're going to use a dome, you're going to use uh, uh, minerals, etc. The issue with the dome and minaret is that in Indonesia, I've been an architect, <laughs> uh, sometimes it goes up to 50% of the minimum 20% of the budget of the mosque goes to the domes or goes to the minarets <laughs> because it's very expensive. There was the issues. Yeah. Uh, so, so for me, if you can construct uh, cheaper domes and cheaper minarets, like I'm, what we are doing uh, using geodesic dome and some of other basic domes uh, construction systems, yeah. it's okay. <laughs> I don't have any issues with that. And, but, but also, the other thing, after you construct the domes, there's also the issues of maintaining the dome. <laughs> there's also another issues. So how are you going to maintain the dome? Yeah? So, so uh, like, like our, our traditional architectures, if you realize uh, our, our apa, may bumbu meru, yeah? we call it uh, apa, a pyramidal roof. Yeah? Pyramidal roof. When you have a problem with the roof, you can easily replace them. Yeah? In, in some other countries, our modern mosques, when we use a dome, we have a problem when we have to maintain the dome. So that was the problem. That was the issues with the dome. Yeah. But, but if it is an easier language to, to be accepted by the people, you can, you can always design it in a different ways. So that, that was the, the, the message. It's correct that the, that the mosque in Indonesia is very much on community base, which is very good. I found the same uh, scenarios also in China. So in China, if you go to Xi'an Mosque, mosque in some areas in Guangzhou, you can see that the mosque actually belongs to the people. It mixed with the people, means it serves as a community center. Yeah. It's not only a building like a monument. Yeah. I, I used to have one, one uh, project yeah, in, in back in 2003 when we are designed to build up a mosque beside the airport, <laughs> beside the airport in one country. Lah. So when we ask the, the client, why do you want to build a mosque in, in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Nobody going to pray here. So that's so so. How about the, the karia, eh? the karia with the communities? Who's going to praise that? No, this mosque is good because uh, when tourists come, they will see the mosque. <laughs> they will recognize, they become a tourist attraction because of that. So it serves a different purpose, different function because of that. So I think there's a lot of discussion is going on there. Okay, back to the questions. So institution of the mosque means you're running the mosque in the professional manner. Yeah, this is very important. Number one is that uh, if the mosque shouldn't ask for more donation. <laughs> if you run the mosque, the mosque should, can, it should be able to run on its own bad budget. Yeah? I give you examples. Yeah? Uh, every Friday, uh, Khatib was uh, uh, presenting a, a khutbah. <laughs> he was, he was uh, delivering a khutbah. Nobody is actually uh, recording the khutbah. 
if you record the khutbah every Friday for the whole month, you have five at least. If somebody is, is diligent enough to transcribe it, the khutbah of the khutib, it can become a book. <laughs> it can you can sell the record, you can sell the the books. So that's one sample. It's very simple. You don't you don't need lots of money. So you can easily uh, get money from that, and lots of things. Yeah, most that's why in the, the most compartment now people are selling things. One in, in Malaysia, the most important in most is that you must have a tempat makan. <laughs> you must have a restaurant there <laughs> because people in Malaysia they like to eat in the restaurant. Then they go to the mosque. So those kind of things, I think, uh, one of my students actually doing that. He's uh, from a business background. I hope to present in another event lah. In another event, we can present the business model of mosque, <laughs> which is very important for us to develop so that the mosque can be run on itself. Yeah. I think I think that's all for for, for my question. Um, a hand raised uh, from Muhammad Abrar Firzatillah. Uh, is that using dom on making uh, a masjid or masjid that? make that masjid can be is that it then is that using dom on islamic architecture that make us know that the building used for islamic person or or else i think it's too, 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 too. Uh, Moss, uh, the problem, I, I tell you stories. Uh, there's a stories of one architect, you know, one architect uh, coming, ba coming back from Middle East. He want to, to design the as Islamic building for his house. <laughs> this is a real story. Yeah, what, but one of my friends, he was telling the stories. So uh, after a few months, yeah, he decided to turn down the, the dome. <laughs> so we asked him, well, why, why you turn down the dome? Because, because what? People I keep coming to my house. Asking where the place for prayers, nak solat tu dia tanya. People are keep coming to the house. I say, is this a musola? There's a mosque there. So mosque might be a language which will be understood by many people. And then then my friend say, okay, I cannot take it anymore. I turn down the mosque, the dome. I change it into other structural system. So dome is actually is a, is is a one structural system. Yeah, in architecture field, we understand there's one one. When you want, if you want to cover certain areas. Yeah, For example, you want to cover certain areas, you use a dome yeah, as, 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 a, as a roof system. So, it's one form of uh, construction system. At the same time, it's one form of language. A dome is not actually, it's actually not coming from Islamic architectures. <laughs> so, if, you if you're looking for the histories, yeah, if you're looking at the histories, actually the first building using dome, it's actually not, it's kind of coming from the Muslim countries. <laughs> yeah, if you're looking at the Pantheon, yeah, Pantheon was built during the Rome's time. Very big one, I think 35 kilometers, uh, 35 meters, sorry. It's very wide, very big, yeah? It was using a dome. Even uh, if, you, if I'm referring to some historian, some historian, when they reconstruct the Masjid Na, uh, Nabawi, yeah? actually some, some, they are actually uh, importing, yeah? importing some expert yeah? from the Western countries, yeah? from the Western uh, uh, countries to take the expertise to build up a dome in the in for the for the masjid nabawi yeah when when they they constructed during the earliest time yeah there was uh, uh, information that i get from the historian yeah during that time so the the only problem as i mentioned before is not about whether you're going to use a dome or not because the cost of the buildings is not a cost of the building itself yeah the masjid is not only about building it's also about institution so when when you build up a building You also need to build up the institution. So if the dome costs you a lot in the construction, you don't have any more money to build up the institution. So that, that is the, the, the key element of the things. I think that's all, uh, uh, doctor. Sorry for, for the times.
um, address to Professor Razia from Bapak Said Azhari. The question is, um, e-commerce can support the growth of halal SMEs by facilitating online marketing and point of purchase. In fintech, Sharia payment systems can be used to make it easier for people to use the Sharia platform for the daily transaction needs in halal manufacturing. How can, digitalize, how can digitizing factory operations significantly increase production for local and export markets in various sectors? Silakan, Professor Rozia. Uh, thank you very much. So actually, I have uh, sent in my my response uh, in chat box. So as for me, uh, I really uh, believe that the difference are uh, only between uh, manual process and the uh, uh, automated or digitalization process, where uh, it will significantly impact the time. Okay, so when we talk about time, so when it is uh, done manually from the customer to provider services, so it will, uh, uh, as compared to the digitalization or automated activities for the manufacturing in halal, either to customer or import exports and so on. So uh, the efficiency is most, uh, will basically be different uh, comparing uh, manual uh, request and demand to the uh, automated or digital uh, activities uh, process. And as of the fintech, fintech is also one of the uh, uh, monetary systems uh, that normally use uh, in order to, to make ease the transactions of uh, money or payment uh, within the, 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 the companies and within uh, businesses. Okay, that is also time saving, lots of time saving there and uh, it a little bit more trusted than uh, manual processes. So I hope that that answers the question. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, last, there is one more question here for Dr. Norma from a student. A very interesting uh, question. Uh, I would like to ask you, Dr. Norma, can a person without any knowledge about programming, but is really interested in learning about it, can you please tell us where we can start and what are the first things that we need to learn about? Okay, while we wait for Dr. Norma, I see a hand raised here by Mega uh, Iliadi. To Mega, you can um, raise your question. My name is Mega Iliadi. I am an information technology student at Araniri State Islamic University. I want to ask Prof. Norma. Uh, thank you, Prof. Norma, for her excellent explanation. I want to ask, I am working on an essay about graduate detecting uh, recitation readings using the convolutional neural network method uh, and the Python's programming language. Is there another method that is more accurate to detect the uh, recitation of Tajwid Al-Quran? Thank you. All right, uh, actually you are using convolutional neural network, okay, to do the prediction, all right? So as uh, you need to know, the first is you develop the uh, algorithm of the convolutional neural network for your development of predictive analytics, all right? So in my uh, uh, opinion, you need to uh, know about the development algorithm. So mathematics modeling is one of the uh, indicator okay, to develop your um, algorithm. And then the statistic background, okay, uh, because you need to investigate okay, whether this is considered to be okay, for cars okay, to do 
uh, prediction or to do the observation, to do the monitoring from the data. All right. So now mm, I don't know about the okay, your question just now. Uh, reading Quran is a process. All right. For understanding, okay, you need to collect the data. All right. There are so many ways to collect the data nowadays. Maybe you can use a sensor we call it as an EEG. All right. So you can also use, uh, for example, okay, EOG. You can also use um, other sensors to put uh, at the brain wave, okay, brain, all right, and then detect whether the brain is uh, fulfilled your requirement, for example. Okay, others is uh, by using the questionnaire, okay, for people uh, doing the activities, reading, okay, listening, uh, literacy, and others, all right. So uh, the important we want a data. From the data, okay, it depends. If the data is very minimum, you can go to the smart PLS or PLS. If the data is huge, okay, you can go to the machine learning, okay, machine learning approach, all right? If they're too big, you can go for the deep learning. So nowadays, in the fourth industrial revolution, in all the educational 4.0 activities, people looking for data. Because nowadays, okay, it's very difficult to go for the face-to-face -face because of the con COVID-19 environment out there, all right? So based on the data, we can start a new business model, new uh, product base, okay, new in innovation, right? So uh, good luck because uh, I share screen here. Nowadays, people looking uh, expertise from mathematicians and statisticians to be a data analyst okay, using a machine learning. There are so many software, okay, uh, open source and licensing to support your analysis. And data scientists is more on the uh, developing the descriptive analytics, okay, and also develop the predictive analytics. Okay, they also have uh, okay uh, how you do the visualization of the data, whether one D. 2D and 3D before we make a decision making for the specific uh, application, right? So uh, I send back to the Miss Chair. Sorry to inform all of us that um, we are very limited in time and we are going to break our room. So allow me to close this session. Alhamdulillah, we have now reached the end of the agenda. Uh, after a very productive and useful day today, where we had all the varieties of talk and discussions, which will be, inshallah, very useful for our scholars, researchers, partic uh, practitioners, and our students, as well as our faculty members and for the benefit of our community. My gratitude goes to all respected speakers, presenters, and participants who have joined the conference. Thank you very much for joining us. To all attendees today, your attention to prioritize and participate through the whole session in the first international conference for ICOS is highly appreciated. Now we have come to an end at the first half of the event. We will have a short break and continue our parallel session at 2 o'clock this afternoon. For all those participating in the parallel session, please check your abstract book for room information number. Finally, I hope this conference can inspire and benefit all participants because the purpose of this conference is to increase the motivation and the spirit amongst researchers thus conceived as a platform for scholars, researchers, and for the government and stakeholders without excluding our our research students both here and abroad. Together we can contribute to the development of science and technology in our country globally inshallah. We apologize for any words or actions that are less pleasing. We once again thank you all and have a very nice day and the breakout room is open. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.